All right, how's it going, everybody? My name is Antonio, and uh, we're probably watching this on uh, Friday, I assume, which means that this is the CEO barbecue. I am, however, as you can see, not in my usual dungeon. I have once again been allowed to venture off into the world. This time I'm in uh, Switzerland at the SMI conference, Swiss Mining Institute conference. Wonderful show. I've been coming here for a couple of years now. Haven't ever recorded anything because it's just I won't meeting companies for personal reasons here, basically. But I did uh, meet the ore group guys here today, so four of them were here. And I thought I'd do a little barbecue with them. So we sat down for a little barbecue. That's what you're about to watch here. But right after that, we go into the normally scheduled programming uh, where it's just a normal barbecue. Four companies in there. But yeah, I suppose I'm not going to lose uh, too much of your time. Um, I was about to say that Switzerland is probably one of my favorite countries in the entire world. But that's probably going to trigger some people. Uh, so I'm not going to say it. Maybe I should say it to get more comment. Anyways, whatever. Um, enjoy this and uh, let me know what you think. All right, so it seems like we have a sort of a good part of the work group here. So this might be a, a good opportunity to maybe go through some of the more tougher questions or stuff that you typically don't get asked. Uh, but as the barbecue is heating up, maybe we can start off with a more of a soft question. If you will, Andrew, let's start with you. You recently appointed the CEO of Amali Resources. Um, let's start with a why. Why do you think you're the right man for the job? Why are you the CEO? Um, I've been the, the lead technical guy uh, on these projects. Uh, since we, we pegged them, and I was actually instrumental in pegging the permits there. So um, uh, from when we picked up an initial permit, I also, as we were first movers, uh, pegged the, um, as many of the surrounding uh, ground as, as I could. And, um, and beyond that, I, I've got a protracted history in, in West Africa, um, been, been working there since 20, solidly since 2010, and... Um, um, when we made the changes with ORCAP, I was in a position where I was um, struggling because I wanted to keep the project because it was always the project I'd been looking for um, as, a, as a geologist for a long time. And, and so um, being able to bring ORCAP into the fold and, and for me to take over CEO was just a natural way to, to move forward. And, and uh, we've managed to progress the project really well in the in the last uh, 12 months so i'm pretty sure that i'm the right guy for the job all right well, well we'll get well looking at the share price this week i i tend to agree so we'll we'll get back to you um in a second steve let's uh take it over to you uh you're actually the ceo of two or group companies now Correct. it's to be three what uh yeah talk to me about again they're two different companies uh why are you the right man for those two jobs well, I suppose that's a very subjective question. I suppose I, I started the company, so I guess that sort of de facto makes me the right guy for the job. Um, I'm very fortunate for what I do. Um, I, I love it. I wake up in the morning and I look forward to working with, you know, all these guys right here. And um, I think each of them are the right men for the job, by the way, more importantly, because I think that's my job is finding the right person for the job. Um, you know, as Andrew was saying, he's the key guy in the project. I mean, this is his vision. Um, you know, in Awali and finding that project, defining a new district, convincing the world's largest gold mining company of his vision. Nobody noticed it until we started proving it with the drill results. Uh, so I think that's a talent I have is recognizing talent in other people. And then James, <clears throat> James, uh, online they call him the, the uranium bloodhound. Um, you know, and I think it's true. I mean, he's got a track record and uh, I, I found him sur surreptitiously. Um, by YMP uh, in the Peter Monk Award, he was nominated for the award, and I said, "Who is this guy?" And then I, and I was looking to make a counter cyclical bet in uranium, and I couldn't find an asset that I liked, but I found a guy that I liked. And um, you know, uh, Charles, who's a key key guy in, in my world, um, he he and James saw the same thing in uranium, or had the same view on uranium, which was what we call you know base load 2.0, which James has done very effective. Uh, been very effective in proving out and making discoveries and we're, we're looking for more discoveries this year with a very ambitious drill program that he's overseeing and then tony um tony again i met him through imv which is sort of a common frequent um common denominator of, of, of people that i find and and I've, I've i've worked with tony in many things but tony sourced the knack project because it was his it was his uncle gary uh, who unfortunately has since passed but it was it was gary who said tony and Steve, he said, you need to buy that. And so we did. And so that's why I think, I think those guys are the key guys. And then I think, you know, the, the thread there is me identifying these people, working with them and doing everything I can to support them. And that's what I like doing. I'm very fortunate to do it. I'm also the CEO 
of QC Copper and Gold, which again was Charles's vision. He's not here, but I'll speak for him. He's the right guy for the job. He had, he saw something nobody else saw. And um, I helped him move it through the process. Now we've hired um, a, a new president, Guy Labelle. And I think in time, shareholders can see him, he transitioned to CEO. That's the plan. Um, we'll take it day by day, but I, but I mean, he's a wonderful operator and, and a very experienced guy. And so, so I'm going to get him to learn the ropes and then he's going to be the leader. And that's the model behind ORCAP is to identify assets and, and good people, put them into our, our, our platform, if you will. I hate to use that cliche word, but I mean, there's, there's economies of scale and lots of benefits for being a part of this group because we can attract higher quality people. We can... Um, and, our, and our unit costs are lower. And I think the brand speaks for itself because we've had great success. All three of these companies have phenomenal successes at various points in time. But I think how we operate, long-term views, quality work, money into the ground, not into you know, promoters' pockets, it's part of our philosophy. And I think it's, it, it will pay dividends over the long term. Right. James, what about you? You transitioned into this job basically from being a uranium geologist to being a uranium CEO. You've had your pretty much all, your entire career in uranium as far as I understand it. How's that switch going? And and yeah, I mean, how, how is it to be the CEO now, what, three years? Yeah, not really a switch. It was a very easy transition. I kind of had an idea of the whole the background of, of, of running a company. And again, the, the vision hasn't changed from what I was doing as a geologist. You know, you drill, you explore, you want to make discoveries. But I think where we've switched things around and the vision that I helped bring to, to the ore group and to Baseload is that we don't want to discover a deposit. We want to find a mine. Okay. And that really solidifies everything we're looking for. And so now with, you know, with, with everything that we have going, that's a big push for us is to continue, continue exploring our, our tier one assets and making those new discoveries on the go. We'll definitely come back to you, uh, what you're doing this year, for sure here. But um, Tony, you also transitioned into this. It's basically first time CEO, as far as I understand it, James, for you as well. Andrew, and now Tony, for you as well. Yeah, what do you think you're the right man for the CEO job here? Well, um, we have an amazing asset. Um, it speaks for itself, but the assets can't talk. So if you have a really great asset, the key is not just finding that depositor, great drill result, it's about telling it to the world. And in this really challenging market, you know, the biggest challenge for us wasn't whether we had a good deposit or not, it's whether people even knew about us. So it's like a tree fall in the forest, but we have everything. We have grade, we have scale, we're fully funded. We have a great partner, we're drilling soon. So every great project needs someone that's willing to stand on top of not just one man, but any man they see and, you know, speak about it. So that's what I've been doing. There's no microphone I won't talk to. There's no person I won't speak to. Um, anybody, everybody. Why are you really, laughing when you say that? Because they know. You know, I ran, I ran for YMP. I started to speak to competitions when I was in grade five. Like, I just love to talk. And it's nice talking about something that is great. And I think his asset's great. And I'm just really excited for 2024. I think program. Tony's just upset that he has to share the microphone with James. So <laughs> Tony, Tony needs his own microphone. That's <laughs> for sure. Well, I'll tell you the story about Tony. When I knew Tony was going to be a great CEO and it has to go, go back to YMP, mm -hmm. which is sort of real fundamental to you know, my progression and Tony's progression in this industry. And, and about five years ago, we had the, the award ceremony, which we, we do every year. And um, unfortunately, my mother fell ill, literally as I was taking the microphone to you know, do the opening address. And she passed out, she fainted, it was a thing. She's fine, fortunately. But I found Tony, handed him the microphone in front of 200 people, you know, all fancy affair. Most people would have, you know, run away, shied away to talk in front of these people. I think and probably, maybe aside from his children being born, it was his favorite moment of his life. He just, so give him the microphone, he can speak, he loves, he loves the attention, um, but he always has something interesting to say. So, um, so I think that's critical. You have to get out there and communicate. You can't be afraid. Um, and, and you have to know how to tell an effective story, not just blow smoke, but an effective story. And I think all these guys have, they're, they're all different in their ways to do it. And some, some are geos and some are not. And I think there's, there's a place for um, technical and, and non-technical CEOs. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got a different way. Well, I, <clears throat> I've gone through the conference a couple of times now uh, today, uh, heard a couple of stories as well. And everybody says, what we're doing, oh, we're adding shareholder value. We're doing something accretive. It's a good deal for our shareholders and, and that type of thing. Let's talk about what you're doing for the share price to go up. 
uh, not because how do you define value in the ground? Quite tough. How I define value to me or to my portfolio is seeing seeing the share price go up. So Andrew, let's well your share price has gone up a little bit. Um, well, actually, a lot over the last month. It's doubled pretty much. Yes, it's uh, more than doubled in the last month, which is um, pretty nice because uh, we've sort of been weathering a storm for a long time. So it's it's nice to have a day in the sun as far as our stock price is concerned. Um, and we've made you know nice discoveries, and and that's actually being recognised now. And so the way to keep that moving is to keep drilling. And we're fortunate enough to have a three million, three and a half million dollar budget for this year. And so we'll, we'll keep drilling uh, on, on the joint venture properties. But on the back of this, uh, you know, we should be able to start cre creating value in, in the company um, with the other permits that I mentioned before, which are 100% of Wiley assets. And, uh, you know, we, we, can, we can start doing, we, we've sort of got intellectual property in the, dis the district now, the new deposit style that will put out, we've got our way of, of, of making those uh, discoveries. So we'll continue to do that on the 100% of Wiley properties uh, along with the um, 25,000 metres probably this year um, on, on the joint venture properties. What do you think it's going to take, again, just to go back to that stock price going up, what does it take in this market to have your stock price go up? I think, I've, I mean, we've just, we need to produce more uh, results, um, show the true potential of that BBM discovery. I think it's got, um, you know, um, a huge potential, uh, multi-million ounce potential, and so we need to drill holes to, to prove that. Um, we've got more results coming through already from from um, the, the Charger and uh, Lando targets as well. But uh, as long as we, we keep um, progressing those targets, not just being discoveries, James said before, things that are going to be mines, right? Um, as long as you're sort of creating that understanding and flow of that 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 is where that's the end game um i think you people appreciate that and you get accretion in in share price and, and value for shareholders Stephen, what about you it's uh tougher in your position maybe you can start with qc but you you've had you've had the resource already uh, announced mm -hmm. what else do you do how do you make the stock price go up from this point i think you're you're trading in like half a penny per pound in the ground not a perfect metric i don't like using it too much but cheap yeah there's there's a lot of noise in those sorts of metrics but look it's a metric and you're right oh, qc copper is cheap and i think that's representative of the value opportunity there i think uh, for qc copper we published uh our updated resource earlier in the year it was wonderful it was a, a nearly a full percent copper equivalent and, and and within that and not everybody loves copper equivalents but within that was 0.8 percent copper it's phenomenal it's uh it's on the highway it's got access to rail uh, low cost power uh, local labor force and, and I, I always say if, if the highest grade open pit copper deposit on the rail in the middle of Quebec doesn't work what does um, what's the challenge there the challenge there is our town uh, the town of Chape is right there and it's, it's, it's a challenge in a way it's a sort of an opportunity as well um, in some some respects I'd rather it was 10 kilometers to the west but that is our challenge that we're focused on in 2024 I think what we need to do the biggest value driver in QC copper aside from the drill program that we're going to come out with in the not too distant future that will drill out mines three and four, which have basically not been drilled at all. So there's growth there. But what, but what people are interested in QC Copper for is for us to define this project, the engineering challenges that the project faces, a mine plan that makes sense relative to our proximity to the town, and, and defining that in an economic capacity. So that, that's what we're doing this year. We've certainly done that, you know, call it scoping study internal. It's very robust. But uh, we have to, we can't talk about that publicly because there's still we still work with the town. There's there's many stakeholders, many considerations in play, and that's what again Guy uh, Guy Labelle we brought him in. He's a mining engineer, very experienced. Uh, that's his task. So I think once we start defining um, this project in terms of engineering and economics, that's going to change the game for QC Copper. And then of course I think more than anything, what you need is is macro headwinds. So once Copper's turning you know a corner here, it's at four dollars plus. If it continues or holds that trajectory and hopefully continues upward, I think, you know, more than anything, that, that can help uh, real projects is, is, is increased uh, price in metal. Um, so I th that's the focus in QC Copper right now. And you're right, it's just, it's just been totally overlooked, which is not an outlier in, in the context of the market. But it's frustrating nonetheless. But th that's, where, that's where we've been. And I, I do think that's the opportunity. Right. We'll come back to ORCAP, but um, I, I want to do James first. Uh, James, you've already made a, a, a discovery in the Athabasca Basin. Uranium's already had uh, a, bit, a bit of time in the sun. 
stock price not going up. What do you do differently this year to make the stock price go up? It's pretty simplistic, actually. We're focused on two major things this year. Number one is continued, continuing to advance Accio. So that is our priority focus. Market may not totally appreciate what Accio is, but what we see internally is Accio is a beautiful deposit with potential for becoming one of Saskatchewan's next mines. Very simplistic. So we'll continue pushing that front. But I think the biggest thing that really will drive our share price forward is a new discovery. Hence, with the, the capital that we have available to us this year, we'll be deploying that in search for a new discovery. And we've got wonderful targets that need to be drilled. So any new discovery, even on, on a new project or within the Accio area, I think will, especially in this uranium market, when now you know investors all over the world are looking at the uranium space and it's hot, a, dis a new discovery in this area, and especially with our thesis of looking for shallow mineralization, could do... Uh, quite wondrous things for our share price and investors moving forward. So basically the same question for you, because you've already made that discovery too. Stock price went up quite a lot last year. It was one of the best performing stocks last year. Um, if there's still room for it to grow, what do you have to do in order to, re I mean, capitalize on that room? Well, I still think we're undervalued. I think the problem with investors, a lot of their decisions are heuristic-based decisions, mental. So I looked at where you came from. We are up 700% since the last time we are at this conference, but... If you look at relative valuation, we're still quite low. Our valuation is $70 million. Uh, there's a company in Idaho that just drilled, and they're $240 million. So you know, I think our project's as good. There's a lot of room to have for price discovery, uh, but it's going to come with the drill results. So my job's just to market, 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 and try to translate things to the 99% of the investors out there. I'm first and foremost an investor before I became a CEO. I think I know how to... You know, tell the market uh, what they want to hear. You know, there's 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 a lot of things going on in American Eagle right now. Um, having a lot of different meetings. People can't get a big enough position. Uh, not a lot of sellers out there right now. And you're seeing kind of three rotations into the stock that I'm seeing. You know, the first rotations are, are, are people, if you want access to a company that's fully funded with great targets ahead of it. Our last two years of drilling, basically off historical shallow drilling and geophysics. This is the first year we'll be drilling off drill holes. The best pathfinder to copper and gold, I always say that's copper and gold. And like we're basing this drilling off geology. Um, look at our bench and shoulder video that we just put out. We know where we're going to drill, but you're seeing three rotations right now. The first rotation is people that want to invest in BC. It's a project to be in American Eagle. Find another one with as good previous drill results that are fully funded. You're going to see another transition starting in May, June, and July. People getting out of the South American plays where the catalysts are disappearing and they want to come into something in North America with upcoming catalysts. That's the second rotation. Third rotation is people that are going to be investing with the fear of, of missing out, the FOMO investors. Uh, and what you've seen, usually when you put out drill results, which we did in January, you see a big lift in the stock and the smart money gets out and people know a raise is coming. But we don't, didn't need a raise. We didn't need more funds. So our stock has steadily gone up and we're now closer to drilling than we were the last time our news release came out. So if we we're able to double in a period of time where copper prices were weak, and we had no catalyst, you know, just wait to see what's going to happen when we get closer and closer to drilling. So my job's just marketing, 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 telling people the story and leave it to the really smart geos, Charlie and Neil, to find out where that extra high grade exists. And I know one thing, I'm not a geo, it doesn't rain copper, it comes from underneath somewhere. If you've got this much mineralization at surface, it's being sourced some from somewhere. I think we're going to find it this year. You need money to do that, obviously. How much money do you have? Yeah, you need money to do everything, uh, eat and drill. Um, we have $6 million in the bank right now. I forecast we'll have about ten and a half, ten, ten and a half million million by June. Our budget program is around $7.5 million. So we're more than covered for our 2024 program with about two, two and a half million dollars uh, in buffer. So it's always nice to have money, but we don't need it. So we're one of the few ones out there, near-term near catalysts ahead, fully funded. So, And just clarify that that's warrant money coming in, right? Warrant money coming in. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. So you don't need money. I was kind of saying, James, with you two, um, not too long ago, you didn't need to raise money, but you found money and you basically took it. Is that sort of the basis that you all operate in? Or do you say like for this year, there's absolutely no more raises coming in? For this year, we're, we're cashed up and we're, we're good to go. There's no need for any more raises. Um, 
even with the discovery on our hands, if, if we make another discovery, we'll be able to allocate the funds that we already have into, into said discovery. So I think we're in a really good, really good position to move this forward. Right. So Stephen, we can go back to ORCAP here as well, just to talk about what, what you do there, because it's recently been kind of re reformed, restructured as a new merchant bank. Um, yeah, talk to me about that. How's money there? Yeah, yeah. Or, ORCAP is unique. It's, uh, it's an investment issuer, meaning we can buy and sell shares on the market. Uh, that's not our, you know, I'm not a fund manager, but what we do is we, we look for opportunities where we can uh, be uh, active investors, not passive investors. So a Wally is a good example. And then you also have Cooper, uh, which is a, a, a private company. Like how does that, where is that going to go public? Does it stay under you? Do you spend money on it? What's the, what's the plan there? So Cooper is a private company. It's it's controlled by us. It's uh, ORCAP itself owns about 50% of it. Uh, plan A is to spin it off and, and, and have it go public, just like we did with QC Copper, just like we did with American Eagle. Under that model, we had dividended out about half of the shares directly to ORCAP shareholders, so they get a tax-free dividend. Um, I don't speak for everybody's tax opinion, but that's that's generally how it's structured. And then we, we retain the other half for our balance sheet. Um, and, and monetize that at, at some point in time. Again, that, that'll be an active investment. We'll, we'll put a new management team in, in front of Cuprum, finance it, move it forward. Again, it's the largest copper resource in Ontario. It's very simple geology. It has had no love for 30 years. We've taken the QC Copper technical team, the resource geologist team, and we're recompiling all of its data, and it's big. It's a big copper resource, again, right on the road, right on the rail, mature mining district. And we bought it super cheap, which is exactly, I mean, that's, that's a fundamental core premise of, of how we, I mean, cheap's not the right word, but, you know, a lot, we play the cycles and, and, and we've all come out of, you know, two or three years of call it desperate times and that presents opportunities. And if you're capitalized one, which we are in the group, we've got tens of millions of dollars, you know, you know more, you know, tens, of, I, I don't know exactly on the aggregate, but we have a lot of money so we can come at things in different ways and that presents opportunities when other people have debt or other bills that need to be paid and they need help. So that's when opportunity um, comes at the forefront. And that's how we've built this portfolio over the past 10 plus years is, is playing the cycles, um, being opportunistic when um, things are low cost, raising capital when the funds are available to you and deploying it intelligently and carefully and as much in the ground as possible. And then Again, it's just about amplifying it, right? So it's it all it, without the results, whether that's an acquisition or whether that's wonderful drill results. Nobody's listening, but if you if you have great results and you can communicate effectively, um, make yourself be known and put yourself in front of the right people, um, not just you know Newmont, not just um, Tech or Agnico Eagle or I think one day Cameco. Um, you know th those are the you know to be able to communicate effectively to the retail investors, institutional investors, and the strategics is very important. It's also, um, uh, to go back to Cooper, I'm thinking about how the management, the board of that is gonna look like, because this, and that maybe is a topic to talk about here, is, but there's, uh, there's similarities between your guys' boards and like specifically with you, how do you manage that without causing too much of a, of a conflict of interest? You also do deals in between the companies well, rarely do we do deals in between the companies. The, the deal that you're probably referencing is the deal between ORCAP and American Eagle. I think that's a perfect example where we had two problems and we found a wonderful solution. And honestly, uh, American Eagle hit it out of the park. So just for context, uh, ORCAP lent, effectively lent, we didn't really loan it, but effectively lent American Eagle a million dollars to expand its drill pro program when its share price was two cents. Okay? And I talked about cost of capital. We would have blown... American Eagle's cap structure out of the water at that point in time because it was tough times in the market. And ORCAP had flow through that it needed to, to, to spend by the end of the year. And it didn't really see anything more promising than that. So it struck a deal whereas um, American Eagle would pay back in $1.5 million, so 50% return on its investment in shares. It paid it back in shares and we got paid back at 20 cents and now at 65 cents. So we made 50% on our cash investment, which has since turned... Um, in, in, into more than a 3x, right? So that one worked out all right. Um, was there a conflict? Yeah, sure, I guess, but it worked out all right. Uh, from both sides, both sides won. In terms of the board, um, each company is separate and distinct. I'm, I'm the common thread through all of the or, uh, or group companies. 
Um, and, and, and that's the way it is. And that's always the way it's been. And so, I mean, I think we operate with the, the utmost transparency, clarity, available to shareholders. Um, um, and that's how it is. And we have no problem with it. Right. Is the idea over time to uh, keep adding companies to the org group or what's the what's the uh, long term plan here, I guess? Not just for the sake of it, but yeah, we see a lot of opportunity out there. And Cuprum is a good example. Um, Cuprum would be you know, our eighth publicly traded company in the portfolio. And I suspect there will be a ninth, but maybe one of them gets bought out. I mean, so like there's no there's no um, um, definitive um objective in terms of how many companies but certainly i think that the platform which which is or group is has a lot of benefits um, a wall is each each of these three gentlemen's success bleeds over and it creates opportunities um, you know we met a shareholder this morning you know he's a shareholder in a wall he's a shareholder in four or group companies and that's not a coincidence right because he knows us he knows how we operate and i think i think we deliver a good product and people understand the risks here there are no guarantees um, but we, we offer um, a good risk-adjusted investment opportunity for those who are looking for big returns because that's the type of returns we seek. And, uh, and I think I've heard you say before and something I said before, you know, you expect failure in this industry. Um, you know, they say one in 10,000 anomalies is a mine, and I think that's true. However, if you've got a team like we have here, you can substantially reduce those risks through, you know, deploying various strategies. But it all comes down to to people and our ability to pay for the things they need to do to drive things forward. That all said, I'm starting off in a, a place that I haven't spent too much time in myself. That'd be New Brunswick and Newfoundland on the eastern shores of Canada, as well as central Canada, specifically Manitoba, kind of being in three spots at the same time, where I'm talking to Max Porterfield, CEO of Kalanix Mines, a precious and base metals exploration company. Companies listed on the TSX Ventures Exchange, and the ticker symbol CNX, where an average of about 15,000 shares trade each day. With a 52-week high of $5.35 and a 52-week low of $1.27. With a market cap of about $23 million and only about 17.5 million shares outstanding, today this is a $1.32 stock. There are 1.5 million options and 2.7 million warrants, resulting in about 21.7 million fully diluted shares. 23% of the company is in the hands of management and associates, and 45% is held by institutional investors and family offices. So that leaves about a third, 32% in the hands of retail investors. As of the last financial statement, which is dated uh, December 31, the company had about $700,000 in um, current assets, about $600,000 of which in actual cash, given a, a runway of about five to six months. Uh, that cash sat on the balance sheet against short-term account payables of about $380,000 um, as well. Uh, the same statement tells me that Calinex again spent on average about 120 ish thousand dollars per month on operational expenses, and um, uh, no money was spent on drilling over that last three-month period. Please do head over to the company's website as well as setterplus.ca, though, to look at the numbers yourself and, and, and to fish your news releases because um, – as all non-revenue generating companies, these companies rely on the public markets and uh, you need to watch that for yourself. Boring stuff aside though, there are multiple projects to talk about here. The flagship is called the Pine Bay Project, which is in the Flin Flon Mining District. Uh, Pine Bay is in the um, it, it is the home basically of four VMS deposits over a 10 kilometer trend. Those are polymetallic vulcanogenic massive sulfide deposits and they are they're not as hard, actually, to explain in barbecue terms, if you will. So I'll try, but essentially it comes down to there being something like a sm smorgasbord or something along those lines of, of meats under the ground, which all get sort of cooked up together by, well, obviously lava, just like the zinc, the copper, the lead, and the precious metals in this case, they've, they've sort of been cooked up together. When they get too busy down there and too hot, volcanic activity shoots that cooked mash of smorgasbord, if you will, um, pretty much straight into the ocean as these volcanoes are underwater volcanoes. When that hot fluid mixes with the seawater, which is much colder, it solidifies into massive sulfides, hence the name. Now, when this happens, that often means that there are hydrothermal vents around the happenings, and those vents, like on a barbecue, they spew out what is too much, basically. And in this case, it was mineral-rich fluids, which uh, build on top of the previous eruption, creating layers and layers of minerals or 
smorgasbord, whatever you want, adding sort of extra flavor to your barbecue. This is no longer just a thesis for Calnix, by the way, as they've drilled about 10,000 meters over the last 10 years, and they've made two new discoveries over that period. Uh, and that's also not incredibly surprising considering that there are historic workings here and about 300 meters away from those historic workings is where four holes over a 175 meter strike length were drilled, intersecting narrow but high grade stuff of up to 3.3% uh, copper, with which was by the way at, at about 440 meters of depth with historic um, the historic resource on here again confirming um, that this is not out of the ordinary, as that study showed that there is 1.6 million tons of 2.8% copper equivalent, with the majority of that deposit being actual copper. So uh, okay on the equivalent grades, I suppose. Staying in Manitoba and still in the same Flin Flon district, though, but moving a bit to the west where we can see another one of Kalanek's land positions called the Flin Flon Project, named, of course, after the town of Flin Flon, which is about two kilometers away here. This project is early stage, uh, not drilled by Kalanix yet, and historic drilling was rather shallow and unclear, but the geological thesis here is still the same, potential VMS deposit, kind of like Hood Bay's 777 mine, which is not too far off from the borders of the land package here either. And a recent geophysics that Kalanix did do, they showed them two zones and 14 specific drill targets that might be perspective for the same style of mineralization with the, the smorgasbord and the volcanoes and everything. Uh, to say it in words that I understand. The chase for sm smorgasbords, though, doesn't end in, in Manitoba, as Kalanix has uh, multiple other projects in Newfoundland, which apparently is uh, one of the richest VMS districts in Canada on a per square kilometer basis. The project here is called Point uh, Leamington, and this is one of the more advanced projects in the company's portfolio with a historic resource on it with on occasion, double-digit zinc mineralization, high grades of uh, gold and silver, as well as some copper in there as well. All of that is happening at a vertical depth of about 350 meters, by the way, but that's, of course, not why Kalanix got its hands on this deposit, but rather because they believe there is expansion potential here. Although advanced, this is not the most advanced project that Kalanix has its hands on because they also own the Nash Creek project, which is in New Brunswick, uh, this is at the PA stage. It's uh, showing an, an open pit mine with a 10-year LOM, a 25% post-tax IRR, and a post-tax NPV 8 of $128 million Canadian dollars with a $168 million capex. I'm not doing a full project overview here because if I tried, I might faint due to loss of blood to my brain. But again, here Kalanix believes that there is expansion potential in several directions and including at depth. Another project, and this is the last one I promise, that the company believes is open for expansion is the Superjack. It's uh, located south from Nash Creek, so still in, in um, New Brunswick. And it knows three separate VMS zones with the largest one hosting 328 million pounds of zinc equivalent and, uh, again, open for expansion. And Max, now I'm going to try and shut up uh, because this is exactly where I want to kick it off. You have plenty of projects, right? Not unexpectedly, you also believe that they are ready and prime for expansion drilling. But this market either doesn't care about that or it doesn't believe you, partly because of these deposits. Again, they I mean, they need capital in order to proceed, right? So this stock strategy here, many avenues at this stage, but what's uh, what's the way forward for you? Well, yeah, no one thing to build upon in Manitoba is we've drilled over 100,000 meters uh, at our Prime Bay project. Mm. Uh, we just published a maiden resource last July. And uh, that maiden resource quantified really the culmination of over 80 drill holes into our rainbow discovery, which we made in 2020. Uh, rainbow came out at 4.6 million tons, grades 3.65% to copper equivalent in the indicated category. Of that, over 3% of that is copper. So rainbow has emerged as one of the richest copper discoveries in the world. Uh, as you stack up that resource base alongside the um, Pine Bay deposit, which was a historic resource in the property, and that puts the global resource at Pine Bay of 5.7 million tons. And as it relates to the over 30 past producing mines that have gone in production in Flin Flon uh, is, is particularly significant. It's one of the largest maiden resources in the camp's history. And since 2020, we made another discovery of the Alchemist, which is another deposit that sits off further to the, to the west. And then last year, we hit a brand new discovery called Descendant. And Descendant, it sits in a very exciting area of the property uh, that actually where exploration dates back to 1911. 
where the likes of Placer Dome more recently in the early 90s called for a 30 million ton target on the area based upon some key geologic indicators as well as some geochemistry support to that. Uh, so that descendant discovery we see is another area of immediate resource growth where we can significantly grow our resource base past just uh, under 6 million tons that we announced last July into an even larger resource with this brand new discovery and future strep out drilling. Uh, we believe that we're at the top of the descendant discovery, uh, and it's very analogous to what we're seeing at the nearby rainbow deposit that we drilled out over the past several years, uh, and that on kind of more edges of the, the deposit or distal part of a VMS deposit, you'll get different metal distribution as well as grade distribution. And what we're seeing at the top of descendant is very similar as to what you see at the top of the nearby rainbow deposit. With that being said, the one key difference is, is the alteration system. So you mentioned earlier in your introduction about VMS deposits, but a key indicator of your a VMS deposit and the potential size is your alteration, which is the fluid flow from the volcanic event that would be displacing that, uh, that VMS deposit at surface when there was an eruption taking place. And the alteration system around descending is about 10 times the size of what you see around the rainbow deposit, which is another promising indication that aside from, you know, the grades, the widths that we're hitting and where we feel we are, uh, that supports that we're on something special at this brand new discovery that we're looking to expand here in 2024. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, we've come a long way uh, through exploration since 2014 at, at Pine Bay. Uh, and this is on the backdrop of something very significant going on in the local community of Flin Flon. So Flin Flon has been producing for over a century and the flagship mine that was operated by HUD Bay Mines that controls that uh, the concentrator in the town and all that infrastructure ceased operation in July 2022. So you've got a community that's been based on a century of mining uh, in Flin Flon that's no longer has that stability. And that one is the opportunity for Kalinex and why we've seen so much success over the past several years on the heels of the, uh, the first discovery rainbow alchemist and now more recently descendant that we're very excited about the potential for moving forward. How's the, uh, I didn't intend to, to specifically start with geology here, but we'll go back to the other things as well, but how's the lithology? Cause you say the alteration patterns are kind of the same as that rainbow, but is it set in the same stones basically? Uh, yeah. So if you look at the host rock, um, in the setting that you have at, at Pine Bay, it's analogous to actually the Chisel Lake Basin, which is where Hud Bay is operating the Lawler Mine. Over there, you've got a, a large felsic package, similar age uh, as well, uh, a bit younger rocks than the, the rocks in this, the community of Flin Flon. But you have a large felsic rock package, and then you've got a very big, large alteration system and a number of smaller deposits uh, that sit along that. Uh, and then the ultimate, the missing giant there was the Lawler Mine. Uh, the, ult the, the felsic package at Pine Bay is the largest felsic volcanic rock package that's been mapped at surface in the entire Flint Flon and Greenstone Belt. And it's honestly, if you look at a map, it's about 100 times larger than the felsic package that you see that hosts the original Flint Flon mine and then the, the subsequently producing 777 and Kalanan mines that you know, total nearly 100 million tons of mineralization there. Uh, and why I mention all this is that 90% of the mines in Flint Flon are hosted in the felsic rocks. Uh, so we're looking in the right environment with the right, um, you know, alteration, the geochemistry support. And more recently, what really led to our success on the property is bringing in other tools that were non-traditional. So if you looked at all the mines uh, in the history of Flint Flon, the Flint Flon really flourished after the original Flint Flon ore body was discovered in 19, around 1914. Uh, through the advancement of geophysics in the 1950s, uh, electromagnetics. And really electromagnetics, whether it be airborne, surface, or you know, later in the 80s and 90s, the, the uh, invention of borehole electromagnetics, it was really the key kind of tool set. Uh, you look for you know, an electromagnetic anomaly, something conductive in the right rock types, uh, it could be a, a you know, potential conductor that represents enough uh, base metals to make a mine. And so that only works for so long. And I think the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over, expecting a different result. And, you know, you look for one thing one way, you'll find that one thing, but you could also be overlooking so many other things. And so really the development, uh, not only just from an exploration thesis and a different understanding of geology throughout time, it's been bringing tools that are non-traditional vectoring tools for these VMS deposits, 
particularly in the Flint Pond Greenstone Belt. And that's, you know, aided very successfully in a resounding success. We brought in IP in 2018 with a different mindset of how we're going to approach exploration on the property. And that led to the maiden uh, initial rainbow discovery. Mm -hmm. Through rainbow and that understanding, we then use that and under, gave us a reinterpretation on the environment, the geology, which led us to the alchemist discovery in, in 2022. And then in 2023, reinterpretation of geology on a historic area, we had some success where Plastidome had a big target, uh, led to, to the discovery of the descendant. And now what we're doing today is we're using magneto telerics, which is again, a new geophysical tool that hasn't had been used with any sort of, of uh, success in the, the Flint Flon Greenstone Belt, uh, or really utilized in this way in this type of environment. And we're using that uh, in the similar way we're using IP, uh, but it's the data is collected differently than the IP. You're looking for similar rock properties, but the depth potential is uh, much greater. And these deposits, how they sit at Pine Bay are, are near vertical, they're very steeply dipping. Mm -hmm. And with that, um, bring, presents its own challenge on how you look for them. And, you know, the initial results on the MT survey that we put out a, a few weeks ago, just about two weeks ago now, I believe, uh, are quite promising. So we're expanding that survey over these discoveries. Uh, and we believe, again, a picture's worth a thousand worlds, and it can really shine a light about the exploration potential and what's to come at these discoveries. Uh, and the one that we're most eager, uh, of course, on is the descendant uh, that I mentioned earlier. And the descendant has a, a similar sort of vertical plunge and it's steeply dipping orientation, just like Rainbow does, if I'm not mistaken. How does that, does that influence the entire targeting process or, or is it a main part of it? How do you look at that? Well, so what you have there is, is um, multiple stacked horizons. So if you, you took out a, you know, imagine a volcanic plain hmm. and then you have a tight folding and so it's an, like an accordion uh, in, in many ways across this growth fault corridor that hosts all these deposits. And so you have, you're have looking at a fold at depth, and we're going to be targeting the fold nose. Uh, but yeah, that's what's the stratigraphy is what's controlling the mineralization, that horizon, and the subsequent event that caused that folding is what places them near vertical and very steeply dipping. Mm -hmm. And once we hit rainbow, rainbow near vertical steeply dipping just like pine bay then we hit on alchemist and the mineralization alchemist suggests near vertical steeply dipping just like rainbow and pine bay and in 2014 when we started exploration at the property we had really focused uh on where the descendant is actually located and the exploration in this area of the property again goes back to 1911 the geology indicated that and we had actually extended a stored placidome hole about 40 meters it hit a really wide interval of exceptionally high grade material, but we couldn't replicate it. Mm -hmm. And once we started, we had a reinterpretation as we reevaluate things. It's, it's a constant process. You get new incremental data, and then you take things back on across the entire property. And that's when, you know, we really highlighted we need to have the conviction to go back and just drill deeper. Uh, and that's what we did. We did a 250 meter step out uh, from a, a, the 24th hole that we had on the property that was, you know, 2.6 meters of over 3% copper equivalent. And when we stepped out, we hit four mineralized zones of very wide intervals. So, you know, on average, if you look at rainbow, we're looking at eight meters true thickness. The four lenses across those, there's over 40 meters of mass of sulfides. And we believe based upon the geology that we're looking at, that they're, that, you know, we can step out in different areas of the system and, and get one solid mass of sulfide lens. We believe it's cross-cut by dikes. And when you look at the potential of the alteration in the fluid flow in the system around the descendant, what's feeding into that, you really have everything that's indicating that you're potentially onto something really big. Um, when you look at the metal distribution at the top 200 meters of rainbow, uh, you're looking at the composite grade there is roughly 1.55% copper equivalent. When you look at the mineralized intervals that we hit in the two holes that we now have into descendant, which again are about 127 meters apart from the discovery hole to the fall of hole uh, 112 wedge one. Again, your grades are between 1.2 to 1.7% copper equivalent, zinc gold dominant, just like you see at the top of rainbow. Uh, but the widths again are, are much bigger. So again, as we move forward with exploration, we're gonna be doing step outs vertically below our intersections, but based upon those widths, 
per uh, vertical meter, we can build significantly more tonnage than that at Rainbow. And, you know, that can really transition this discovery into a tier one discovery. And the one thing that's kind of keeping us away is really looking at things from uh, a much larger resource space. And we've got a slide in our presentation that uh, kind of speaks to that, uh, that you can review some point. But again, if you look at these deposits, they typically grow two to three times once they get into mining. Mm -hmm. And we believe that we can build a, a much larger resource much more quickly at depth on descendant based upon what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that should be highlighted that's advantageous for the property is how close to surface that rainbow comes. If you look at it, Flin Flon overall, there's always been a mindset in Flin Flon that the near surface discoveries had already been found and picked over because that the depth penetration of surface pulse electromagnetics is 400 meters. They, they say you can see down with confidence. Rainbow, we hit at 900 meters vertical depth, but it comes within 100 meters of surface. So that in lies at a potential to ramp accessible where you can get into mineralization much more uh, quickly at a much lower capital cost. And I should remind people that aren't familiar with Kalinex, we've got a hydroelectric power line within a few hundred meters of Rainbow and the Pine Bay deposit on site, a historic head frame and shaft, direct road access, water, and we're about 20 to 25 minute drive to Flin Flon, where there's a, a mill that sits idle that there's potential to access in multiple deal structures um, that are, you know, obviously we're meant to be uh, completed. Um, but again, that creates a potential pipeline or pathway to production quite quickly at a much, much lower capital cost uh, than any of our peers. You know, a lot of the peers that you look like in the industry, in the industry are going to be very, very remote. Uh, your CapEx cost could be in the, you know, north of a billion dollars because you got to get all that road power people out there where we have all that set up for us and, and waiting in, in many ways. Mm. But a couple of things definitely to talk about here. Uh, but I'm thinking all about continuity, uh, proving up continuity. That's basically the next step, as far as I understand it, for the descendant. That's correct. Yeah, it'll be stepping out on on descendant. We have these MT survey results that are are, are due out, and that can really shine a light on what's to come and what the potential size of descendant is. When you're looking at these deposits from a, a conductivity, obviously you're looking for highly conductive for copper. But when you move away from the traditional vectoring approach, you start looking at chargeability and resistivity. And so what we're looking at with MT is a resistivity low. And we're looking to potentially map where descendant will fold over at depth back over onto the Pine Bay horizon. Again, there's that fold. And that's where you have potential to build very, very big tons very quickly and is in the nose of a fold in these VMS systems. So again, uh, it's going to be an exciting year for exploration, uh, irrespective of the MT results uh, at Descendant. But I, I do believe that the MT data can really shine a light on what's potentially to come uh, at the Descendant discovery in that area of the property, as well as over Alchemist as in target area Odin. Odin's another area that sits directly between the alchemist discovery and rainbow uh, that we have some sniffs on. We like the geology. We've got a lot of indicators, geophysically, geology, and geochemically that are, are vectoring us in that direction. And we're hoping MT can shine a bright light on what's to come there as well. So there's a, a lot of stuff uh, from the exploration perspective that uh, we're waiting on. That's going to be very, very exciting. And that's just going to lead to a very, very compelling and uh, transformative, uh, potentially, exploration campaign this year. It's, it, it does sound structurally complex, though, also when you bring in the dikes um, and also some of the other controls that we talked about earlier. It, like, how much drilling does it take in order for you to really zone in and, and start to better understand this uh, this system here? Well, every drill hole you drill, you learn a bit more. Uh, you know, I think that in terms of discoveries, we've gotten very efficient with exploration, bringing in new tools and, and, and taking uh, risks at right times that have led to these discoveries in sequential order. Uh, it took a number of holes because it took a number of tries, you know, we in terms of our exploration approaches before we really refined the model to, to lead us to Rainbow. Well, Rainbow was uh, about the... 25th or exploration hole on the property on the initial discovery hole. 
Hmm. And instantly when we hit those two zones of high grade mineralization, we knew we were onto something special. Uh, we had a lot more confidence when we hit the, the, um, the confirmation hole into rainbow. And, you know, just each hole, you learn more and you get more confidence. And that's going to be the same on any discovery. Uh, if you look at, you know, moving off of rainbow to when we hit alchemist, it was about sixth or seventh hole again before we hit the discovery hole. And it's about follow up. But then we broadened our exploration approach in this last campaign in 2023. And that's what led to the descendant. And you have to prioritize things as always. Um, the descendant area has always been an area of priority going back to 1911 for very key reasons. And now to hit on that um, was, you know, really another five holes on the property before we hit on descendant. And now we've had the confirmation hole. We're confident. We believe we know where we are within the system. And the only thing that's going to uh, to show that outside of trying to paint a picture with an MT survey is going to be through further drilling. And, you know, I, I do believe that'll come together quite quickly for us. Uh, just like things have in the past. What what does that mean more specifically? Where I'm coming from with this, because you said you want to test the or try and grow the resource at depth, uh, but when and how do you follow it up? Um, is well, we followed up with the MT results to again kind of paint a a, a treasure map around the discovery, uh, and and that you know has potential of showing that it seems to be working on the first initial line that we we announced the market, and we're still waiting to get those results back. Uh, to receive and process and then and also share with the market as well. Mm. Um, but, you know, going back to it, it, it's hole by hole. You're going to need to do another vertical step out below the last step out of 112 and see what comes of it. Ultimately, the truth machine and our expectations would be that you're going to start transitioning into a more calcopyrite, which is copper hosting dominant mineralization uh, as you get away from the top of it or distal. So when you're looking at a VMS event, imagine my hands are a volcano, right? And the, the volcano is depositing this mineralization through the sedimentation process on the side of the volcano. That would be where your massive sulfide lens would be mm -hmm. located. Down here is your alteration package. So when we say the bigger the alteration zone, it's the bigger the volcano or the bigger the volcanic system, right? So the bigger the volcanic system, the longer it was erupting, the larger the correlating mass of sulfide deposit. But going back to this, the closer you are to the proximal part of that system where that vent or the heat source is, is where you're going to have the high-grade copper. And as you go more distal or further away from the vent where it was coming out, that's where you're going to have at cooler temperatures, different metals drop out, and that's where you're going to get the zinc and gold-rich part of the VMS system. And so based upon that, where we've seen it rainbow, we believe that we're at the top of descendant and going at depth and stepping out to 100, 200 meters at a time out of the gate initially, we're anticipating transitioning into the, the high grade at depth. And you know, in terms of de-risking that in some capacity, we're looking to use the MT survey results as a way to kind of quantify what the, the target is at depth and what to kind of expect. But ultimately, either way, when you're in a system like this, you need to step out in 100, 200 meters in intervals, see what comes, and then make decisions based upon that. And that's the same thing that we did at Descendant, and you do that with any discovery that is right out of the gate. And the thing is, it's so unique because oftentimes you look at a lot of these companies, and it's a historic resource they're operating off of, but at Pine Bay, every new drill hole is a, a drill hole into mineralization, potentially, of course, a bed space one success. Or that's brand new, that's adding volume based upon this now maiden resource he published last July. Mm. Why am I asking that about the deeper holes? It's not because I'm worried about about it from a, from a geological standpoint, because it seems that most VMSs in, in that region are more or less at that depth, as you said. This looks like what you've found previously at Rainbow and stuff like that. I'm just thinking about when and how do you follow it up in terms of finances um obviously in this time of the market nobody's having fun right so do you get in a strategic to help you in does hud bay get interested at a certain point and come in and, and you know you sell a little bit of the upside forward but you have them help you drill like how do you take it forward from here on a financial standpoint well i think from a strategic standpoint you want to leave your options open when you're on really onto a discovery like we're on to obviously hud bay would be a great partner. They have a great production track record. We have excellent relationships with that organization. But at the same time, um, a discovery like the discoveries that we're having in North America in a tier one jurisdiction with this rule of law 
and the potential to grow to significant size. And I remind you, our exploration ex, ex, uh, potential on the property, Placidome had a 30 million ton target just on one area of the property. Inmet came on the property, had a 20 million ton target on the property. And so we're sitting at 6 million tons. We've got a number of discoveries that can significantly grow much further past that. And I think really strategically, you want to leave your options open uh, because the world is much larger than just the natural uh, synergies that sit there in Flin Flon with Hut Bay. Uh, and, you know, from our standpoint, we've always been able to attract capital uh, at appropriate terms that were both fair for the investor as well as our existing shareholder base. And that's worked out well for us. And right now should be no differently. Yes, the market is challenging. Let's not uh, shy away from that. It's been a tough market for all juniors that are particularly in the base metal space. So we're not in, in any different situation than anybody else than that. The difference for us is that we've got some pretty very high grade deposits that have exploration potential uh, and, and uh, the potential to significant grow very, very quickly and their location and their path to production on the backdrop of the base metal market that we're on, and I think people are certainly waking up to, and that's where the disconnect is right now, you ha don't have the macro fundamentals aren't pricing in to the underlying equities that would benefit from those. Uh, and that's really what's been frustrating for equity investors that are positioned in copper. I mean, you're looking at copper today, I think we're at $4.13, uh, 15 cents copper US a pound. Uh, and typically in the economic environment that we're in right now, you would be looking at a $2 copper. But the reality is, is it, it's supply demand fundamental driven. It's a very, very tight market right now. And you're seeing that all the way down to the smelters. I mean, the smelters are you know cutting the treatment charges down to just over $11, uh, which is insane. But that's going back to the fact that there's no concentrate for them to process. And that's going back to show you there's an issue with mine supply. And there's an issue with mine supply while everybody's looking and going, are we on like teetering on a recession on a global basis? Uh, and so that's what the exciting part of what's going on is for us is, you know, things will change and we just need to have our sales adjusted that when the winds change, we're ready to, to really set sail. Uh, and we're very well positioned because of the discoveries, the structure of the company is very, very tight. Uh, and so, again, you've just got to manage the storm that we've been in for is what it is uh, and realize that, you know, the opportunity is still there uh, to make a tremendous amount of money as we unlock the, the value of this discoveries. At what stage, though, do you start considering getting in a strategic and what are the conditions? Like if I, I don't know, something weird happens, I get a job at a, at a major tomorrow and they tell me, go you know, go, go and find me a VMS. I find your deposit. I say, Hey, Max, let's do something. What do you want from me? What do you want from a strategic? Well, it depends on who you are. And I think okay. that the wants are going to differ on the deal structure. So there's, and, and who the, the partner is. I mean, obviously uh, there's many opportunities out there. There's opportunities to utilize existing mills in operation. For example, the deal structure on those existing mills can be done in multiple different ways. And so I think it would be premature to pigeonhole uh, uh, or kind of box ourselves in on one outcome. You know, the deal or the opportunity with Hut Bay is much different than a deer with another major that would be coming in with much deeper pockets with a diff much different outlook. There's different opportunities with, you know, leasing a mill, acquiring a mill, utilizing another existing mill. There's backhauling potentials. There's all kinds of deal structures that can be done with different types of potential suitors and for ourselves, we just need to focus on transitioning this discovery into a tier one asset. And the stronger the discoveries become and the stronger we become, the larger and, and the bigger the opportunities become for our organization. Hmm. But but if I if I uh, HUD Bay or, or whatever it is, I, I what I'm thinking about is what if I, you know, someone comes along and says, let me let me get in on the asset level, 70 percent, and I'm going to spend five million bucks on this over three years is that a type of deal you would look into no. on an asset level no 70 percent for five million no yeah yeah there's a lot of deals that happen that way and that sort of help you i don't know well then and then people look back on those deals and go wow that was one of the worst deals ever made it's true but, so, but i'm not in the, i'm not in the position to, to want to do that and, and i don't mean that in, in any kind of disrespectful way but you know we put over 25 million dollars into the pine bay project and that's you know, leading to all the discoveries, leading to the delineation of those resources. 
you know, I think there's opportunities that are much more creative uh, and create more value for our shareholders than doing a deal like that. Hmm. A deal like that simply doesn't make sense. You, you do have other projects uh, that I assume would be open for for a deal. Like if I want to get in on the PEA project in uh, New Brunswick, will that be easier to let go for you? I mean, every every deal, uh, every opportunity has a, a price or has a structure. And again, it's largely dependent on what is the structure, who is the partner, and what's the deal? So absolutely, I think the, the assets to monetize at some point in the cycle uh, in a different way uh, then certainly our flagship being Pine Bay would be the assets in Eastern Canada. Uh, and again, there's a lot of different potential opportunities, but certainly those opportunities uh, we evaluate as they come across. And at some point, uh, there'll be a structure and, and a deal with the right people that makes sense, then we'll execute on that. We've mm -hmm. divested assets in the past uh, when they weren't core to us. And we've done that and created value for our shareholders. And in, in both times we did that actually on the same property. Uh, and, and it's worked out. So we, we've acquired assets, we've divested assets, and we'll do what makes the most sense uh, at any given time. But I think for right now, we've got a very lean, uh, you know, team. 80, 90% of the capital goes into the ground. And that is what's going to underpin value for the organization. Hmm. What about something else i'm just thinking so sort of strategically how do you move this forward without having to raise a bunch of capital um like a, a spin well, I think, out or I, I don't you know I, I everyone really fears dilution i think that's the thing that it concerns people uh yeah. the reality is, is that how much value are you creating for the organization when you do a dilution and yes you get impacted by shorter term phenomena in the market and we're dealing with that right now um, there's ways to mitigate dilution in Manitoba in particular with expiration. And we've been able to do that numerous times with the charitable flow through structure. Uh, and you, you just need to realize that, you know, if you're, you're going to invest in a biotech company that doesn't generate cash flow, you need to realize when they do capital raises, they're going to be reinvesting the business to create value. And the way you need to create value is build pounds in the ground on a per share basis that outperforms. Uh, when you go to raise that capital, and I think we've set ourselves up for that moving forward, we've got the structure in place uh, to really mitigate dilution to do that drilling. I mean, the delta that we receive for every dollar raised in Manitoba is over 1.8. Uh, so it's, you know, really halves your dilution when you look at the exploration uh, costs, uh, getting that kind of leverage to your dollar and just owning up to the fact that, you know, dilution is part of the process. And when you're adding value, that value will be realized. It might not be realized in the immediate term. And that's really the opportunity for investors in the, the resource space is that it's an inefficient market. And you see that market inefficiencies right now. And you've got to use that opportunity from a risk reward standpoint to position yourself to make money when you see these type of opportunities out there. So, you know, I personally have used it to increase my position numerous times when I've seen opportunities in the company. Uh, to build that long-term position. And I built a position when I'm, I believe, the, the largest fi uh, publicly filed sh uh, shareholder today. And I have no uh, doubts or uh, any kind of regrets on that decision. I'm very excited about those decisions each time I look at it. And that's the thing in life in general. I really look at the world that when you're going through something that's tough and in the, in the moment you're like, this is the worst thing that could ever happen to me. You feel like you're getting your, your face kicked in. You're getting kicked in the stomach. And they're just, you know, spitting on you afterwards. You only think that that's a horrible situation in that moment. And you got to take a step to stop and reflect in the future in terms of really, was that a, a, a bad point or was that one of the biggest stepping stones ever? Mm. And for me personally, there's been some inflection points in Calinex uh, and, and this journey that we've kind of been on over the past year, uh, 10 years now coming on since uh, I joined in 2014 and focused on these VMS deposits. That, you know, in the moment, they felt terrible. And I'll tell you, after the zinc market collapsed, the U.S. Chinese trade war that was going on, and we just published our PEA, and, and the, the, the market really threw the baby out of the bathwater. It felt when Calinex went to a $3.5 million market cap. We were down to, on, uh, uh, be a 35 cents on a um, post-consolidation share basis. And at the time, if you'd asked me, at the beginning of that process, I would have said, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Everything that you know we'd worked for as an organization 
had truly been flushed down the toilet. But, you know, when you change that perspective, and I changed my perspective in that moment. And I was like, this is actually the biggest opportunity for myself and for anybody paying attention to come back, make these discoveries and create a lot of value and became a, a started building my position in the open market uh, predominantly uh, to su support the company and saw that as an opportunity. And so, again, that's seeing things in the moment that look as not great, but realizing that they're actually a huge opportunity longer term. And I just did it again more recently with the early exercise of some stock options that was going to be expiring in seven months from now. And, mm -hmm. you know, I looked at a standpoint going, well, where do I believe the stock's going to be from seven months down? Do I think we're going to be where we are now or, or do I think we're going to be in a much different positive situation? And I, I believe that we're going to be in a much better situation moving forward uh, and use that as an opportunity to grow my position. I, I see that you've also been purchasing uh, shares in the open market uh, outside of exercising these options here in the set I filings. What do you think your average cost of uh, capital is right now for your own shares? I, to be honest with you, I have no idea. Um, this is like, uh, I don't know, this, this is something like a baby to me. It's like a family member, Kalanix. It's uh, like the child, each discovered like a child. So I don't really look at things and, and, and kind of manage things. I know my accountants deal with that. Uh, I don't know the cost basis, quite honestly. There's been so many purchases over the past 10 years and so many different structures, whether it be taking down options, a lot of the open market purchases and, and a bunch of different accounts. I would go on to guess that my cost base is probably over $2. Okay. Um, but again, I can't tell you that with like, oh, my cost base is this because it is what it is. And I, I know that, you know, longer term, the move isn't to make 10, 20%. Uh, it's to really transform this into a, a a big, big discovery. And with that, your, you know, equity valuations will follow suit. Hmm. Do you, when that original deal took place, um, when Kalanix was basically spun out, um, it, it was basically a Kalanix royalty, you know, Kalanix binds as it is right now, spun out of a different company a while back. Who kept the royalty on, on the Pine Bay project? So there's a, there's and Pine Bay in general is over 6,500 square hectares. So again, it's a very, very large land package. And that entire land package in its entirety has been put together in multiple ways. So the royalties, NSRs, they were literally uh, changed from claim to claim on different claim box that were put together in different ways. And I, why I say that is it's not like one you know, royalty across the entire land package. It's, it varies. And that's just the nature of being in a mature mining camp and doing different deals over the years to consolidate. Uh, so the way the structure occurred though, in terms of your question about the spin out from Kalanian Mines. So if there was a pre-existing project in Kalanian that was spun into Kalanex that had a royalty and that royalty had a buyback provision, Kalanian retained the right to the buyback provision. Okay. So for example, if there's a 1% NSR, Half that NSR can be bought back by the operator for five hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars, whatever it might be. That buyback right retained with Kalanan Mines. Now, in late twenty fifteen, as you might be aware, people that are following this probably not aware if you're not aware of the situation to begin with. Uh, but they were acquired by Altius uh, Royalties, uh, and so Altius now would subsequently retain uh, the rights to any any kind of buyback that would be pre existing on a royalty now. Any deal that was done subsequent to 2011 um, on any of those assets in Eastern Canada, for example, those royalties will be done, you know, when we made a transaction or they're, they're pre-existing. But Kalanan uh, Kalan Mines, which is now Altius or under the Altius umbrella, mm. uh, wouldn't have any connection to this. Right. Okay. Because you mentioned it was your baby, I was basically checking in if you if you somehow ended up owning any of the royalties in the project. That's where I'm coming from. Um, oh, no, no. I, I Just for the record, I, I came in after the spin out. I came in in yeah. 2014. Uh, Kalanex was advancing a graphite discovery uh, at the time. Um, I had different thoughts on that in the path for the company moving forward and always felt that the opportunity was to make a world-class base metals discovery, a high-grade discovery in the Flin Flon dis district. And uh, we're obviously looking in executing on that now, uh, 10 years later. And that's the thing I think that people that aren't as maybe appreciative that are new to approaching exploration companies 
is it's on average the sixth or seventh company on a property that finally kind of puts the puzzle together, it solves a riddle and makes that discovery. And beyond that, it's typically exploration companies that take more time uh, on a property to learn instead of, you know, taking one shot and then that not working out and then having to find a new project and new approach, right? It wasn't until our fourth exploration campaign on the property, which is, again, you know, over numerous campaigns, numerous years that led to the first discovery. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's perseverance, having the conviction, uh, and then thinking outside the box to leading to these discoveries in different ways, which is kind of the recipe for our success. Mm -hmm. But far too often, either the management team gets too discouraged too early, or they're unable to further that because they don't have the support from the investors, which is obviously a key part. You have to be able to raise the capital to take the risks on the property. And throughout the years, I guess say with a great deal of uh, gratitude that there's never been an exploration idea, uh, thesis, exploration work that needed to be done on the property, a drill hole that we wanted to drill, that we weren't able to capitalize finance to get the work done. Uh, mm -hmm. And doing so at a, you know terms that were right for ourselves and the investor uh, to get that work done. And, and we've been in much tougher markets than we've been today. And I assure you that. Well, you're operating on the edge, so uh, you must be sl sleeping well at night. What do you, do you think uh, royalties is, is – is it too early to start talking about that, getting a potential royalty interested? I mean, Fred, the the guy bus up behind Elemental Altus, which, I mean, Elemental took over Altus, whatever merged. So Fred's running that. Um, do you think he'd be interested in this project at this stage, or does it need more drilling before you can start talking to potentially I'm getting – I'm sorry, who, who, who are you saying? Who's Fred? Uh, Fred's the CEO of Elemental Altus, so I assume they would. Oh have no, no, a... I, I think you misunderstood. Al Altius Royalties. Oh, it's Altius. Company. I'm thinking about a completely yeah, different yeah, company. No, they're out of, yeah, um, they're actually shareholders of okay. the company. Uh, they they supported us uh, on an equity investment on one of the more recent capital raises, uh, which is great. Uh, there's a lot of royalty companies that'd be interested in a royalty on on a discovery like ourselves that have shown mm -hmm. that interest. Do I think we're too early on that? I do believe that we're too early on that. I think that a transaction like that would happen way further on down to more of the development stage where you have much more value associated with that royalty. I think truthfully, you know, and again, these royalties predated uh, myself being on the property and they are much lower than a lot of the comparable royalties in the Flint Flon district. But, you know, royalties done on this is really just a hindrance to the property longer term. I think far too often royalties get put on properties way too soon um and they you know the people that take that risk really get them for a song uh and sure. and uh yeah i don't know there's people that are leaning to royalties uh because they think it's a way to access or reduce dilution in, in tougher times uh, but yeah no I, I don't think that's uh, the avenue for us in the immediate term fair point what are you, what else is um do you need any any permits locals and 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 all the Fauna and flora up there, everybody happy? You can just keep drilling if you figure out the money thing? Yeah, so we have two drills actually sitting on site. Um, we are within a mineral lease. We have five-year exploration permits. Uh, again, we have very close ties to the, the Manitoba policymakers, and we've had their support throughout the years. We've received a number of grants. One of the things I should mention, uh, subsequent to the, the, the cash position that you highlighted there, we did get an, another $250,000 uh, in the Treasury from a grant from the Manitoba Mineral Development Fund that specifically focused on highlighting uh, and, and, and supporting uh, projects uh, that will revitalize old infrastructure or existing infrastructure in northern Manitoba. And we received a number of grants from the MMDF all the way back to the original discovery hole in a rainbow uh, and throughout that process. Uh, in addition to that, I've also you know, took down some options, as you mentioned, which added another further $150,000. Uh, and our, our burn rate is much lower, right around about $80,000 when we're standing still uh, outside of just doing that one MT survey. So, uh, but going back to that, uh, you know, there's rule of law in Manitoba. There's been 32 mines in the Flint Flon area. There's a big incentive uh, from the community. They're highly motivated for a new mine to come online. We're within a mineral lease. There's advanced permitting when there was a bulk sample and that's where the head frame and shaft are there. Going back to the late 1960s, the most recent feasibility was done at Pine Bay in 73 by Hut Bay. 
on the Pine Bay deposit, which again is dwarfed by the Rainbow deposit that sits about 800 meters away from each other. Uh, and in terms of timelines, I think that you're really going to be in a position where you could go through uh, and get the proper work done in an 18-month timeline. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is is uh, been done before. If you look at the Reed Lake mine, those were similar timelines. It was when uh, about 120 kilometers away from Flin Flon. That was uh, another deposit that was within a provincial park. It didn't have the infrastructure we utilized. You were in a $2 copper price environment. And they were able to get that permanent. And actually, the, the Lawler mine that's currently in production by HUD Bay, I think, broke a, a record in Canada uh, from construction, uh, from project description, which is where you put all your 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 the the work in uh, for processing to get your your uh, construction uh, approval was 12 months at Lawler. And so again, the permitting regime in Manitoba is very favorable. They've always been favorable for uh, new mines to come online. A big part of northern Manitoba's history and, and livelihood has been uh, mining. And they're even more uh, focused on that with the critical mineral in initiative in Manitoba. So, again, we're going to be in an area that can be fast tracked and we can have a compressed capital cost relative to any of our peers. And that could be even further facilitated if we're able to utilize any of the existing mills uh, in the area, whether it be the Stall Lake Mill where lava is being uh, produced currently, or whether it be the idled mill that's much closer at the 777 uh, mill in Flint Flon that could be restarted and is currently on care and maintenance. Uh, because, you know, that could, you know, compress your capital costs. And again, this would be forward looking statement and we haven't done any work around that, but you could be in a situation where your upfront capex could be 50 million uh, getting down to Rainbow and starting production on something like that. Mm. How much, um, you, you mentioned you have three, uh, two drills there right now. How much is a meter of drilling costing you in Manitoba? So your meter of uh, drilling is roughly about $250 a meter. And then in terms of like a wedge hole, which will cut off because we're doing deeper holes, like cut off six, 700 meters of your hole, uh, depending on how much wedges, but say on a, a hole that we wedge a lot, and this is going to be on the extreme, you're looking at $500 a meter uh, when you wedge off. But again, you're saving you know, six, seven, 800 meters before you set that wedge uh, on that hole. Uh, and, you know, that puts us in comparison to a lot of our peers, even in Canada, that, you know, or you're looking in the Yukon, these people are drilling for $750 a meter, a much more shallow type hole. Uh, and that's because, again, we don't have a camp. Our camp is Flin Flon. Uh, we own two homes outright that we've owned for many years in Flin Flon. That's where our team stays. That's where the driller stays. We own the core facility on site, which is where the old generators were for the head frame and shaft and the old mine office was for Pine Bay is our office. Uh, and everybody drives out to work every morning, again, 25 minute drive uh, from town. Uh, so it's a, a really good fit uh, for everybody. Uh, we have no problems getting drillers because uh, as drill jobs go, it's a very beautiful area, very peaceful in many ways. And it's very convenient because you have people living in Flint Flon. I mean, um, we have a driller, just kind of anecdotal, that I built a, a nice relationship over the years. He's been on, on two of our discoveries uh, named Cooney. And Cooney's a second generation driller from Flint Flon. That's his nickname. And, um, you know, he's just a, a real gem of a guy he, that I built a relationship over the years is, you know, being on different drill contractors for us. And he's from Flint Flon. And that's the cool part is that you got that buy in from the community where everybody's really rooting for you to win, no different than them rooting for the local hockey team, the, the Flint Flon Bombers. You've got a lot of people in the community that are really rooting for Kalanex to succeed because they see Kalanex as an avenue for economic livelihood and stability to be brought back to Flint Flon that's been really lost with the shutdown of the 777 mine. You've got to keep in mind, when that mine shut down, that was over 800 jobs that were lost for a community of just over 5,000 people. Mm. And so forced a lot of people into retirement, or now a lot of them are having to go work remotely in Snow Lake on two week on two week off shifts, which is you know, you know, a big drain. I don't know if you've got to travel a lot or had that experience where you're traveling frequently all the time going with your family. That's not ideal, particularly when you're used to being at home and being with your family the entire time, like these miners have been, uh, with you know having the seven 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 mine and before that the Trout Lake mine that operated for three decades and then. Or that the Flin Flon mine that operated for over 60, 70 years. Mm. Well, 
wife doesn't let me leave the the second bedroom that she has me trapped in right now. So I uh, no, I don't travel a lot, but I can only imagine how uh, hard it is. When's uh, when's the next news release? What are you gonna see there in that news release? Um, talk to me about that. Well, we have uh, set the expectation that the next news or one of the next news uh, releases that be coming out would certainly be our MT results. So what we did is we most recently announced, I mentioned it earlier, but we did a one kilometer test line over the known pine beta deposit. And we tried doing it over rainbow. And it was different because the uh, we're doing this survey with Abbott TP Geophysics, who we had a lot of success with using IP. And Abbott TP is working as the contractor with Zong Geotechnical uh, out of Reno, Nevada, that develops and has their own MT system. And so we did that first test survey because MT had not been done over a lake and Pine Bay sits in, over the lake. That came back very, very favorably and started showing an emerging target at depth. So what we've now done is we've expanded those survey lines to three kilometers because at three kilometer survey, you can see much deeper with more confidence. And so we've, we're covering over Pine Bay, over Descendant, over Alchemist, and over uh, target area Odin. Uh, with these long lines and so the, those results which will also really lead into defining our upcoming, upcoming exploration campaign and the path forward for us will be uh likely the next news release that'll be out on the company in the coming hopefully weeks and, and again i say that it should be in the next couple of weeks um but i rely on other people to provide things at different times that's the forward-looking statements we always talk about so um Fair point, Max. No, this has been this has been good. I um my notes look like serial uh, serial killer notes, uh, but I appreciate this sort of more in depth overview. I don't typically get to see those of you, um, online as much. So yeah, thanks for sitting down with me. What am I forgetting to ask you here, though? What are we What are we not talking about? Well, how you purchase shares of the company, and you can do so. We trade on the Toronto Venture Exchange on the ticker CNX, and we also have a, a listing in the United States under the ticker CLLXF. All right, moving on to Norton, BC here, where I'll be talking to Marco Rock about Cassiar Gold Corp, a uh, gold explorer and developer with a 1.4 million ounce open pitable gold resource. Companies listed on a TSX Ventures Exchange under the ticket symbol GLDC, where an average of about 150,000 shares trade each day with a 52-week high of $0.74 cents and a 52-week low of $0.23. Cents. With a market cap of about $30 million and 105 million shares outstanding, today this is a $0.28 cent stock. There are almost 10 million options and 22 million warrants, resulting in, let's call it, 136 million fully diluted shares. Insiders and advisors own about 13% of the company and institutional investors from the likes of Sprott, Crescat Capital, and Willow Middlecoop's Commodity Discovery Fund own about 28% of the company as well. As of the last financial statement, which is dated December 31, the company had $3.9 million in current assets, most of which in actual cash, sitting against account payables and other liabilities of about $240,000. According to the last, uh, the same basically financial statement, Cassiar spent on average about $135,000 per month on general and administrative expenses and about $370,000 on exploration costs, leaving the GNA to exploration ratio at about one to 2.7, which means GE accounted for um, what 27% of the, spend, the total spend here, give or take. Please do head over to the company's website as well as setterplus.ca, though, to review uh, all of the numbers and the, the, the newest numbers by the time you're watching this, because this is an active company. Um, running a company costs money. This is also a company that's not revenue generating, obviously, so they rely on financings and things change. Accounting aside, though, let's go uh, through the meat and potatoes here. There are multiple projects to talk about. The Cassiar Gold Camp is one of them. It's a 59,000 hectare or 590 square kilometers of land in um, north central British Columbia. And um, the, north, the north part of that deposit is creatively called Cassiar North. Uh, that's where the 1.4 million ounce inferred resource that I was telling you about at the beginning is located. And that's grading at 1.14 grams of gold per ton. But it remains open in all directions, which is also why a lot of the exploration dollars have been going in here uh, over the last couple of years. With the last six holes from the 2023 drill program being announced about a month and a half ago, something like that showing multiple 100 gram meter holes, uh, albeit at lower grade than the overall resource with highlights, including 101 meters at 0.84 grams 
per ton of gold and 178 meters of 0.59 grams uh, of gold per ton. Mineralization here is mostly basalt hosted, low sulfide gold bearing veins, which in barbecue terms is kind of like ribs being heated to a high temperature. They start cracking and splitting, eventually letting in other taste molecules from like a barbecue sauce or something like that into the rib structure. And with the ribs, of course, being the basalt rocks here and the splits and cracks being the veins that have over time cooled and created layers of um, stuff like quartz, sericite, iron carbonate, and pyrite layers, carrying valuable minerals in this case, like gold. Not always, but in this case they do. Kind of like you'd find pockets of barbecue sauce within your ribs if that's how you take your ribs. Uh, with the veins here being an average uh, width of one to two meters, sometimes double digits wide, but sometimes also less than a meter wide. So uh, bursting is typically chaotic in basalt, and there is vein variability here, which is something I hope to talk about later on. What is notable here, though, is that if this were ever to become a mine, and the mine and um, and the mine would be built, the mine permit and the mill permit are already in place which is something, again, I, I hope it will become clearer in the conversation that's to follow. That's not it, though. Cassier also has the Sheep Creek Camp Project, which is uh, much smaller. It's a 4,000-hectare um, land package, and it's earlier stage two. There's about 4,000 meters of drilling that went into it in 2017 that was drilled by Margo Resources. Uh, but that didn't amount to much. Uh, there's not a lot that came out of, the, uh, out of that drilling, so I hope Marco can tell me more about uh, why he's still holding on to that property and the plan for it later on. Uh, but not before we've talked about Cassiar North, of course, because, and Marco, this is where you come in, but I'm thinking about how big this thing can get. And and the reason for me bringing this up is not because I want you to pull up a crystal globe and, and tell me the exact number, but I'm kind of looking at, the, at your price chart, right? And And even after putting in a lot of money into the ground over the last couple of years, none of it has really translated into shareholder value over that time period. I believe you're down like 80% over the last two years or something like that. So it doesn't seem like anybody cares about a 1 million ounce deposit right now, even if it trades at around what, but 20 bucks per ounce or something like that. So how big of a resource do you think you're going to have to come up with to eventually move the share price up? Uh, well, that's a good question. By the way, I really like the analogy with the, with the ribs, the barbecue ribs, and the and the and the sauce. I never thought about it in those terms, and I, I really like it. Uh, as you said, it's really hard to 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 know how big this is going to get. Um, uh, you know what, what we do know is uh, from that resource uh, from 2022, early 2022, where we have the 1.4 million ounce deposit. That's a one kilometer by one kilometer footprint that even within that pit shell, there's a lot of room for expansion. And that's actually where a lot of the expansion of drilling occurred in the last couple of years where we drilled 40,000 meters. So, you know, personally, uh, and this is actually shared by, by uh, a lot of, you know, uh, the technical people that we have in the company, uh, you know, we feel there's a potential to, uh, you know, at least triple this, uh, the, this resource. Um, and uh, the, the indication that we've been having from drilling, it really supports that. Um, with you know th those 40,000 40, meters we drilled, that was 117 drill holes we've drilled in the last couple of years, and only two drill holes didn't hit mineralization above cutoff grade, which is 0.5, uh, in significant widths. Um, so we keep on expanding the, the, the mineralization around the known deposit, and uh, we also have been finding mineralization in really outlying targets um, like Wings Canyon uh, or towards east, which are within five or 700 meters away from uh, from the known Taurus deposit, where you have all of the 1.4 million ounces. We also, some of the intercepts you highlighted uh, were at New Coast. Um, that's roughly two and a half kilometers south of the Taurus deposit. And it's now roughly a, a east-west, roughly three kilometer corridor. Uh, that could be another uh, potential uh, bulk tonnage deposit, similar to Taurus. Um, and we have other targets uh, like, um, Lucky, where we actually intercepted a quartz vein, four kilometers to the northwest of Taurus. We have Snow Creek with outcropping mineralization, three kilometers to the east-northeast of, of Taurus. And, and again, that could be another um, bulk tonnage deposit similar to Taurus. And uh, they also might be connected. And when you look at the footprint of mineralization, all the showings that we have at surface, um, it's it's not hard to, to imagine that kind of... Uh, 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 potential future uh, mineral deposit size. 
Um, so, so that's that's where I come with a, with kind of a, a 3x on what we have in terms of potential. But that's on a very very small footprint. This where where I'm talking about these targets is you know, probably like a, a 30 square kilometer area around Taurus, and um, um, and that's you know basically just uh, roughly five five percent of our for our land package. So on a very small percentage of our land package. Um, we, I see that potential, uh, and the rest of the team also sees that potential, uh, let alone in the rest of, of, of the project. So we, there's a lot we don't know, uh, but the indications are certainly very, uh, very good. And, uh, you know, the, the potential is certainly there. Now we need to uh, obviously get the truth machine out there and uh, turn this potential and this aspiration into actual mineralization. Um, and, uh, and that's what we'll be doing in the, in the past couple of years, really. Hmm. That's uh, what I what I tell my wife when she asks me to do the dishes. I said, "There's a lot that I don't know what's going to happen, but there's potential I might do them." So, uh, <laughs> you've uh, you've drilled what a total of uh, like fifty five thousand meters uh, so far ish. I, I guess how yes, much more exactly. drilling do you think it's going to take for you to to potentially triple that resource? Oh, so so basically. Uh... A, a good a good indication could be uh, the, the 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 current resource is built on roughly just under sixty thousand meters of uh, of drilling. Uh, so uh, you know you, you have to include assumptions, right? So if if you assume that you can define uh, so if the grades hold, of course, which uh, we don't know, and you know the, the grades can you know go up or, up or down. Uh, I think on average. Uh, actually, our grades have been relatively constant in terms of the new drilling compared to the historical drilling that they included in the resource. Uh, but you know, I think six, sixty thousand meters for a one point four million ounce uh, resource is a good is a good approximation of what it may may take in terms of drilling to replicate that. I think uh, obviously grades need to hold. Um, and uh, and ideally, it continues to be mineralization coming from surface, which obviously in the mining scenario is a much cheaper ounces to to extract when you when you get to that point. So um, so all this is a long winded answer to say, yeah, if you want to triple that resource, we probably want to uh, you know uh, triple that kind of drilling. So call it uh, 170,000 meters to to potentially triple. Uh, Hundred thousand meters of drilling to potentially triple that resource, uh, and you know, obviously we already drilled roughly forty thousand since the since the last uh, resource update. Right. Okay. Um, that's a, a good starting point actually into to what I also initially wanted to talk about, which is the the dilution treadmill, if you will. It's been hard to a lot of juniors out there, especially with the cost of capital being as high as it is right now. It keeps getting higher too. Um, would you consider getting in a strategic partner, or selling a royalty or something like that, to to fund those uh, remaining one hundred and twenty or one hundred thousand meters? Uh, yes, I think you know we have to get like as 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 a steward for for shareholder value. You need to consider all the options, including royalties, including strategics. Um, so, in 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 that front, we we are having conversations both with you know royalty companies, streaming companies, mm -hmm. and and strategics. Uh, Although, you know, like we're really, and talking about how expensive capital is, you know, this is really one of the worst times we've seen in a sector in, in a long, long time. Uh, so capital is extremely expensive. Uh, and, you know, it's not ideal to dilute at these levels. Um, and uh, one thing that it's worthwhile considering as, as well is how, how do you maximize shareholder value? Um, our, our goal is not necessarily uh, our strategy really is to sell this project uh, to a mid-tier or a major, uh, and uh, you know if if we bring a potential buyer way too soon or, or lower capital and give them a foothold uh, in the project, we might also be uh, putting in or, or jeopardizing or not maximizing potentially the ultimate value you get for it, right? Because if mm. if uh, the lower price they can they come in for even for small stakes like a 9.9 .9 or a 19.9 percent .9 stake, um, you know it's less capital they're going to have to disburse in the future. Uh, you know, and when I think about exit strategy, I'm thinking uh, a great bear type scenario. Um, 
and you know i think our our potential is uh um you know not you know doesn't have anything to to shy away from from what they have so it's a kind of a similar jurisdiction in canada as well okay. so that's 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 my thinking having said that we do also have uh, because we have the permits we have a lot of the infrastructure already in place um and we also have a mill there's a potential that we could bootstrap this ourselves uh, probably starting with a small scale production focusing on a high grade with the current mill that we have the high grade underground that uh, we haven't talked about at the Cassier South, where most of the historical production has come from. Uh, but yes, absolutely, we need to consider all sources of capital. Um, and obviously, there's a flip side to this. You know, I think also there's a, a lot of um, investor indifference uh, in the last. Uh, you know, it's been really tough in the junior market market, market space. I think even the, the gold miners uh, are relatively cheap when you look at the gold price. Um, so. Um, so, you know, it, the sector is actually in love, but that's also the opportunity, right? Like, uh, you know, as Rick Will says, you, for, to, for you to make significant money in this space, you've got to be a contrarian yeah. and you've got, to be, you've got to be investing when no one wants to, to be investing in the space. And I, I think that's really the context of where we are, both from the major gold producers all the way to, but even more so uh, down in the juniors, which are, you know, really been uh, suffering for, really the past couple of years, but you know, even more aggressively so in the past six to, to eight months. Hmm. Wait, and, and I suppose everybody's going for um for a great bear, not always um not always easy to do, of course. And 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 anyways, that's something we can talk about later on. But you, you mentioned something about getting in a royalty that, that, that could potentially uh lower the attractiveness of the project or something like that. But there is a royalty on it right now, right? Yeah, we we have we have a royalty on uh, a part of the tours deposit uh, that also extends to a part where we have no resource at this point. Um, but uh, you, well, of course, a, a royalty can always, uh, you know, ideally you want a project with no royalty, right? Mm. Uh, but the, the, to lower the potential exit value, um, I was more thinking about bringing uh, like a major or a mid-tier partner too soon. Mm -hmm. uh, because okay. you know, if 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 uh, if you bring a a, a mid tier or a major at you know a valuation like ours for a twenty nineteen point nine percent stake, um, that's actually not a lot of dollars when you think about it. If you do it at, at market price, and at that point, you know, for a song, uh, a mid tier or a major all of a sudden has a, a, a fifth of the project uh, for for nothing. So to 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 be able to take over an entire project, it it, it, it made it makes it that much easier. So uh, it's definitely something you need to to consider uh, when when uh, discussing you know strategic investment coming from from the big boys, so to speak. Uh, I I agree. Sometimes you would see the argument of oh well, you know, eighty percent of something is better than a hundred percent of nothing. But at these prices, if a major comes in at twenty percent. You could still end up with nothing because oftentimes it's not enough money to go through that one hundred thousand meters or or that sometimes more meters. So good point. Who owns that royalty? By the way, that's on your project. Sable Resources. Okay, good. What's uh? They're they're just holding it. Is that buyable? Do you want to buy it back? Well, for for the right price, absolutely. But uh, it, it's just a matter of prioritizing, right? Like we create the most value. Um, by, by drilling and expanding mineralization, uh, if we can get a good deal on, on the royalty, uh, we'll obviously consider that as well. But uh, you know, the money that we spend on buying back a royalty will not be spent on, on drilling and expanding mineralization. So yeah. it's, a, it's always a trade-off. That's true. How much uh, money do you have left right now? Uh, right now we have uh, just uh, just under four million in the bank. Okay, good. How much uh, drilling does that buy you up in in northern BC? So our direct drilling cost uh, uh, last couple of years were just around two hundred and ten dollars Canadian a meter. Uh, so uh, it's you know it's quite efficient, and that's actually a testament to um, to the access and the infrastructure that we have. Uh, obviously, not as cheap as you see in you know maybe in Quebec. Uh, Quebec is a cheaper drilling, uh, but people you know sometimes think, oh, okay, Northern BC or the Yukon, this is kind of really remote, so it's really expensive. Yeah. Or you need helicopters, and that's really not the case for us. Uh, so, um, you know, our our camp is really nice, right next to Highway 37. 
uh, and you know we're able to kind of drill relatively on the cheap um, as well. So you know it's always uh, and especially in times like this, you really need to pay, pay attention on on the size of programs um, because you you want to really keep advancing the project and expanding mineralization, but also not at an expensive. Uh, uh, you know, really expensive dilution as well. So you really need to find, you, know, you need to find that fine balance and balance between not diluting too much, but at the same time continue to to advance the project because you know you cannot create shareholder value by by you know by sitting on your hands. Um, although you could potentially, and you you see a lot of projects right now across the world that are just not doing anything. They're just keeping mm -hmm. the lights on and waiting for for the valuations to come back up to be able to. Uh, to dilute at more acceptable levels. Um, right. Yeah. Okay, but so four million bucks in the bank right now. Um, G and E, what about a, a million and a half this year? Yeah, between G and A marketing IR, yeah, that's that's uh, that's more or less. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just under that, yeah, more or less, give or take. So, what do you drill? 10, 12,000 meters this year, or are you hoping uh, for more and doing less? What do you think? Well, I'm always hoping for more, but uh, you know, in, in this in the context of this market, and you know, uh, yeah, I think where we are right now, we're probably looking at the five to ten thousand meter program. Uh, of course, if the share price could you know go up significantly, in there's you know, it, it's a significant risk or opportunity. Um, we we could potentially raise a little bit more capital uh, and and drill more. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you 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 would raise capital, but you don't have to. Yeah, yeah, we, we could we we could and we we would, but we don't have to. And obviously, the higher the share price, the more willing we're we we are to to raise, because it's it's really finding that that fine balance between dilution and value creation through the drill bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, what do you where is that five to ten thousand meters going to go in terms of uh, targets that you're focusing on? Which targets are you going to? Yeah, we don't know for sure yet. Um, that's actually a, a process that's ongoing right now. Uh, uh, there's the obvious targets, which is, which is continuing to step out uh, immediately on the on the fringes of of the drilling, uh, where we drill at Taurus, uh, around Taurus, or Wings Canyon area, or, or Taurus East, where um, you know we have consistent and persistent mineralization. Uh, so that's an easy one. Uh, and uh, the alternative uh, is going to some of the priority regional targets. Um, we've drilled New Coast uh, for the first time last year as an operator. We drilled six drill holes there, all came back mineralized. They're really sparsely drilled, so they're several hundred meters away from each other. Um, and the highlight there was uh, a 90, uh, 90 meters at, uh, 95 meters at 0.9 grams per ton. Um, and it looks like there's a bulk tonnage area forming there. Um, uh, we also have two new targets coming from the field program we've executed last year. We, it was actually our first, uh, you know, significant field program. We did uh, a three square kilometer cell grid survey, uh, basically immediately to the east of Torres and all the way to the Snow Creek targets. Uh, we did an IP survey of roughly 12, of just under 12 square kilometers centered around Taurus, uh, which really highlighted, um, you know, the potential extents of Taurus, as well as uh, a lot of anomalies that are coincident with the soil grid, as well as uh, we did a, a mapping exercise for roughly 40 square kilometers around the, the Taurus uh, area, uh, where we've, you know, collected rock, rock chip samples and, and grabs 10, 20 grams per ton of gold at surface with a lot of coincident IP anomalies as well. We have new targets. Uh, two new targets um, uh, that are feeling really good about it. One is called the Boss target, uh, mm -hmm. and the other one is called the Owl Rock uh, target as well. So um, these are kind of some of these potential priority regional targets that could really help highlight uh, the, the potential for multiple bulk tonnage um, centers across our uh, across our uh, our land package. Uh, and then we also have the Cassier South High Grade Veins, um, we, which we've extended quite successfully over the last few years as well. Yeah. But I would say with what we know today and uh, with the discussions that we have, and these are not final uh, targets, uh, the, the ones we really like the most are the priority regional targets uh, like New Coast, Owl Rock, Boss, um, Snow Creek, 
And um, obviously then the more defensive style of drilling, which is just keep on stepping, you know, 50 meter step outs around, around Taurus and, and just make that, that open pitable deposit, try to make that open pitable deposit bigger, given that it's, it's basically open in most directions laterally as yeah. well as at that. A lot of what we've been seeing from uh, Cass here south, though, it looks like, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's quite a lot of vein um, vein width variability, basically, but there's also great variability. Um, how do you deal with that as you, as you keep exploring? Yeah, so Cass here south is actually a very different style from um, from from what you see at Cass here north in those bulk tunnel open pedal deposits. So Cass here south is really high-grade underground veins. Uh, the veins, uh, there's a lot of historical production. So there's 315,000 ounces of historical production there um, from kind of four vein systems. Uh, the, the main mine has produced uh, 150,000 ounces at uh, north of 17 grams per ton. Um, uh, a QSAC, uh, I think it's QSAC. Uh, I think, yeah, it's QSAC, 90,000 ounces at uh, just over 20 grams per ton. Um, and we know that the veins are on average um, three meters wide, uh, of course, they pinch as well. And also there's great variability. But uh, the way I think of, personally think about this, this is, uh, you know, that historical production gives us quite a bit of, um, of indications into what we can potentially expect. You know, for me personally, uh, it's probably the best guesstimation into what is the extension potential of these veins. And, and these veins, these four vein systems are actually, most of them open along strike. And that's what we've been uh, doing, extending those veins along strike. They are east-west trending. Um, and, uh, and of course, you see, you see a lot of, uh, you know, uh, grade variability. Uh, but what you also see is a lot of high grade. Uh, I, I'm just uh, thinking here. Uh, looking at some of the historical uh, uh, intercepts, you know, as an operator um, at, for example, the Bain vein system, uh, we hit 4.0 meters at 35 grams per ton, uh, 6.4 meters at 12.6 grams per ton, 3 meters at 25.7 grams per ton, 2.2 uh, meters at 32.95 grams per ton. Um, so, you know, good widths, good grades, um, you know, very high grade, really. Um, and we, we have a lot of historical intercepts. Um, I'm just looking, you know, on the vein, vein system as well, you know, 1.45 meters at 52 grams per ton, 2.7 meters at 35 grams per ton. So a lot of intercepts like this. And this is also, um, you know, an area where actually on the vein, vein system, we have uh, an underground working that goes uh, up to 50 meters away from the uh, high-grade uh, mineralized and mined vein system. So we have infrastructure taking us straight, straight there. We have 25 kilometers of underground workings already in place. Most of them actually at the at the Escassier South area um, that uh, are a legacy of all this historical production and also leave as a, an amazing platform to for for a future production scenario as well. On some occasions, though, and, and you're right, there are definitely. Uh pockets of high grade but in in some occasions what i'm thinking about is are there going to be pockets of nothing then in that case and so that makes me think about sort of the how the deposit hangs together in terms of continuity what do you think you're talking about the, the cassier south yes yeah so the cassier south the, the, they're shear veins and of course you know shear veins they pension swell uh and you can see by a lot of the intercepts sometimes you get intercepts that are in the you know below a meter um other intercepts can be three, four, five, six meters. Um, and, uh, but on average, we know it's three meters wide, which is also kind of a, a nice number because typically below three meters, you're gonna start having mining dilution depending on the mining scenario you're looking at. Uh, so, uh, so that's something you should, you know, one needs to consider as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so, but, but the grade, you know, so the widths they they pinch and swell, and the grade also goes up and down. But the historical historical grade gives us some indication into what to expect. But and the variability is going to be the variability that it has. There's really not, not much, you know. We cannot really change the nature of the uh, of mineralization. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, from from my perspective, the the historical production give you know gives me and I think the rest of the team 
a lot of comfort into uh, into a mining scenario there. You know, what you really need to see at the Cassier salt on the high grade underground veins is really uh, more exploration success. So you can define, there's no resource on the Cassier salt, although there's a lot of high grade intercepts. Uh, so we don't have an official um, 431 compliant resource there. Uh, but the goal would be to define a say 300 to half a million ounce of um, say, you know, uh, 15, 20, 25 grams per ton material. Uh, we know historically it's closer to 20. Uh, so call it, you know, 300 to half a million ounces of 20 gram per ton material. And if we're putting 20 gram per ton material through the mill that we have, we own, and it's, it's permanent, uh, that mill could be, you know, spitting out 60 to 70,000 ounces um, a year, uh, which is, you know, not really what a major is looking for, but uh, it, it really could be transformational to, to bootstrap a company small like ours, especially in a time where, you know, equity, equity capital is so scarce and expensive and, um, and obviously cash flow is so valuable. So, mm -hmm. um, so how much would it cost to refurbish that mill versus if you had to build it again? Yeah. So, uh, we don't know for sure. Um, we know that actually the, the the previous operator that amalgamated the entire district. So districts would actually have fragmented ownership at a bunch of companies actually operating, producing at the same time, exploring at the same time, uh, including Total, the, the, the energy company. I think they were the ones operating the QSAC mine, uh, mm -hmm. which was one of these underground high grade vein systems. Um, and uh, they, had, they had a budget of uh, $12 million to refurb the underground to fix the mill, uh, to fix some infrastructure on the project and also acquire a fleet and, and start producing. Uh, this is in 2010. Uh, so um, given uh, what we know and, you know, kind of bank it, but back of the envelope guesstimation, we're looking at probably less than $30 million to restart the high grade. Huh. But that's just the capital cost. Um, what's really critical to make the Cassier South a success is really to define that three to half a million ounce of high grade inventory that could give you, you know, say five, six, seven, eight uh, years of, uh, of of mine life uh, from, uh, you know, probably ideally, you know, three or four different phases. So we can really kind of sleep well at night, uh, so to speak. Um, and that's really, I think, where there's a lot of, it, there's a big question mark. And, uh, We've, we've sent our engineers there. Uh, we have engineers on the team, engineers on the board. Uh, we also have mill uh, specialists coming to see the mill and you know, all the components are there, which is really great to see. Uh, and in things that are in relatively good shape for you know, a bit of a, you know, it's not a brand new mill, uh, but, uh, but uh, everything seems to be there. And you know, a lot of these um, you know, mills from, uh, you know, from the 80s and 90s, they can be quite sturdy as well. So. Uh, Okay. Uh, that's that's what you see in terms of of kind of the the the, the potential numbers in terms of uh, of the high grade underground. Hmm. I hope I fooled you so far and made it sound like I know what I'm talking about when it comes down to geology, um, because I've been trying hard. But I um, something else that I've been wondering about is to to sort of go back to what you were talking about. The south zone here is is sort of the the structural geological controls that influence all of the vein variability and grade variability. Uh, because you sound confident, and and the only thing that I can sort of focus on right now is that variability there. Again, that's why I'm bringing it up a couple of times. So maybe you can explain to me what's driving the con the 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 the, this, the gold distribution basically here. Well, uh, I think you know I'm really not the best person to to talk about it. Like I I may have fooled you with my uh, you know geo geological knowledge, but I'm really not a geologist. So I'm a <laughs> I'm a finance guy. Um, so you know. You know, these high grade veins, they have a lot of, you know, typically a lot of, uh, you know, variability. Uh, and, and it's just the nature of, of, of the mineralization there. You know, these are shear veins. Um, um, the gold is also in, in quartz, typically. Uh, there's a halo around those as well. Um, but, you know, basically the, the, quartz, the, the quartz carries most of the gold. Um, and, uh, and again, it's, uh, you know, no, nothing, nothing we can do about the, the variability. The only thing again, that, uh, or, or the main thing that gives me the comfort is all this historical collection, right? It's not like we just yeah. have a few drill holes and we get a, 
uh, an idea of, um, of what's there. There's a lot of historical production, a lot of knowledge uh, into, into those uh, vein systems. And that's actually something quite valuable because we, we don't need to reinvent the wheel in terms of the structural controls there. Um, we, when we look at the, all, all those vein systems, there's typically periodicity. Uh, we, there's parallel vein systems every four to 600 meters. Okay. Uh, and just on the Cassier South, we have you know, over nine kilometers of north-south trends um, that could host multiple parallel veins because they are east-west trending. Uh, just between the, the, the main mine um, and, and, uh, and Cusack, there's a two kilometer gap that could host uh, uh, you know, four or five of these parallel vein systems. Um, and, you know, as you can see from the main mine, you, you, these can carry 150,000 ounces at, in this case, at 17 grams or potentially more. Uh, so, um, you know, just have to keep on drilling them and keep, keep on expanding. The good news is we have already kind of four vein systems that we know in our open and long strike. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we have faulting and we're looking for offsets. Uh, it's, you know, it's not like, you know, a continuous uninterrupted shear vein. Um, but, um, you know, we have quite a bit of, of knowledge, structural control, actually, you know, uh, our chief technical advisor is one of the, uh, you know, biggest, uh, uh structural geologists in our genetical systems in the world, one of the biggest specialists, uh, David Reese, and, uh, you know, he's really been instrumental to the team, not only for the, the high grade underground, but also for the, the bulk tonnage targets is, uh, and uh, you know it's it's really great to have that kind of know-how in in house, but also uh, it's also a testament to the potential of the project because people like this don't get involved in the project uh, uh, just because they can. Uh, it's because they typically see big potential, and you know it's uh, it's great to have that kind of uh, support. All right. Are you doing any metallurgical work too? By the way, this year that's something to get off my list here. Yeah, yeah. Actually, we're uh, bringing on uh, a metallurgist in in house. Um, we're very lucky on the metallurgy front. Again, uh, this is another value add of having a lot of historical production. So, mm -hmm. I mentioned the three hundred fifteen thousand ounces of production from the high grade, uh, from the high grade underground veins, from the shear veins. Um, uh, that's using the mill that we have. The average recoveries there were ninety three percent on average. Um, and uh, all the way up to 96% uh, using gravity flotation with basically with that with the mill that we have. There's actually also historical production from uh, from the bulk tonnage targets. Uh, so there's there were historical 35,000 ounces produced from Taurus East, uh, which is just a few hundred meters away from the margins of the Taurus deposit right now. Um, and uh, the uh, and that that. Um, that material is also processed using a gravity flotation mill with a cyanide circuit at the end. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the recoveries there uh, were in the mid eighties, uh, which is not bad. So that gives us a lot of comfort. Of course, as we find more mineralization in the different mineralization styles, there's always questions on the different domains. Um, um, uh, where, you know, what would be the best methods, uh, what's going to maximize uh, recoveries, what's going to minimize the costs. So, so for that, we're, we're, we're bringing a, uh, looking to bring a metallurgist in-house in so we can really uh, advance that um, in the different styles of mineralization we, we keep on finding because the more we drill, the more styles of mineralization we're, we're finding. And, um, and it, it might be more optimize methods for certain parts of the deposit as opposed to, to others and, and and that's really what we want to see but that historical production really gives us a lot of comfort right in terms of timeline when do you think uh when and how would that um start rolling in like is it going to be met work first drilling then and like how, how do you see it so so typically actually we have a project that we could drill throughout the, the whole year but uh, we typically drill in the summer. Typically, we open camp from May to, to November, just because it's more efficient and safer uh, to stack all the drilling in the summer. And that's basically when we do all of the, the activities. Uh, you know, the metallurgical work will be ongoing, um, and we typically just drill, drill we drill in a, in a, in a summer, uh, just because it, it's simpler and, and cheaper. So typically, you have drilling in the summer, but the metallurgical work it will be ongoing and will be 
uh, it will be releasing results uh, in the future out of that as we as we progress to the different stages. Right. Do you, are you going to be going to Sheep Creek in in any capacity this year? Uh, you mean doing doing work there? Yeah, doing work, not you personally. I'm sorry, it was a confusing question. Yeah, doing work. Uh, no, it's uh, I doubt it. Uh, capital is scarce. Uh, even even uh, in years where we had more resources, we ended up not doing much at uh, at Sheep Creek. Uh, Sheep Creek. It's a very prospective project. Um, you know that that district produces uh, nearly three quarters of a million ounce at nearly 15 grams per ton. And this is all from high grade underground veins. Uh, they're skinnier than the ones we see at Castier South. Uh, so these ones at Sheep Creek are more in the two meter uh, wide shear veins. Uh, I've been into those undergrounds. You can see the quartz veins in the, in the underground workings. Um, um, you're likely going to have a little bit more mining dilution because uh, the, the veins are uh, less wide on average. Uh, mm -hmm. So the thinner they are, the more typically mine, more mining dilution you, you, you expect to see. Um, so, but it's still very prospective. Um, but um, I don't, I don't think we're going to be doing any work there. But it's, it's certainly a very exciting project. It has a lot of potential, uh, and I think in, in a bull market, which I've been patiently waiting for some time now, uh, this is an asset that could be worth a lot. Uh, we could spin it out, we could sell it, we could JV it, uh, or we could drill it ourselves if we have the resources to do it. Uh, mm. It's, it's a valuable project. It's just, you know, it's a bit, um, it's it's a, a victim of how attractive this one behind me is, the Casser Gold project. So because mm. this is, this one is so much more advanced and, and I, I like it better because we have wider veins on the high grade underground veins. And we also have the, the bulk tonnage potential, which is really significant. And it's really the fastest and most efficient way to really grow tonnage, which is really what the majors want. The mid-tiers in the majors, and uh, these days they want two million ounce minimum, some of them five million ounce minimum. Um, and it's it, it, you can grow much faster on the bulk tonnage, uh, this kind of tonnage, as opposed to the, the, the skinny veins. Although the skinny veins can be very profitable because obviously uh, grade is king and, and that drives margins. But um, when you're going for scale, the bulk tonnage is, uh, is, is the way to go. It's, it's, it's more efficient you're more likely to grow faster there. You say that you could do a deal on, on Sheep's Creek. I could do the dishes later on too, but I don't think I will. But are you going to do a deal on Sheep's Creek? Uh, yeah, I could, but I don't know if I will. <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, it's all about, uh, it, it's all about what's on the table. Um, mm. you know, but what do you want? Have... If I come to you and I say, Marco, I want to have Sheep's Creek, Sheep's Creek, what do you want from me? Um, well, I, I, ideally, uh, at this point, it, it really depends on what point in the market we'll be looking at. So different points in the market, there's better, better ways to maximize shareholder value. And that's really what drives the decision making. How can we maximize shareholder value? Um, I think, uh, Sheep Creek, because there's no reason, resource inventory, um, you really need to commit to like a significant program to 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 establish a critical scale uh, where you can demonstrate some solid economics. Um, so I would you know love to JV it to to you know maybe a small producer or a mid tier. Um, we could we could sell it for cash, um, but you know it, it really depends on what. The, What's the deal on the table? What do we receive now? And what can we expect? And who's our partner, our potential partner? What do they bring to the table? So there's a lot of ways to create value. We can spin it out, potentially create a new company. We can divide this to our shareholders yeah. and start a new co. Um, uh, there's a lot of ways to, uh, to, to, to create value here. Uh, it's just, I think in this marketing environment, uh, even like pretty, you know, amazing projects are getting no love from the market, except with a handful of them. So, uh, um, I, you know, I like to keep it on the, on that, on the back burner, on that barbecue. <laughs> sure. Well, let's, uh, let's, un let's un maybe drop it here, pick it up sometime in, um, the summer when, you yeah, some, something along those lines when you think you're going to have, 
news out, I suppose, over the next like two months ish, something like that. Yeah, so we'll open camp. Uh, we'll work, open camp in May, which is uh, basically uh, less than two or two months away. Okay, cool. And we're basically now, um, you know, finalizing budgets, uh, like going through targeting. Uh, you know, kind of prioritizing what are the most exciting drill targets. You know, thankfully we have, uh, you know, more targets than we can drill. Uh, mm. That's that's kind of a Hollywood problem. Uh, now I just need a Hollywood budget uh to to solve for that problem but uh yeah i think uh you know i i'm i'm uh, i'm very bullish into you know the gold price is moving but the equities haven't really cashed up um yeah. i think they will um i don't think this is well this is both wishful thinking as well as a, a fundamental core belief um and you know i'm putting my money where my mouth is i just um you know i just you know, in December, I put $248,000 of my own money into the last placement. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely willing to put more, especially at these valuations. So um, it's, uh, you know, um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll advance this project at the speed that the market will allow us to create that value without, um, without diluting our shareholders too much. So it's really finding that right balance between not diluting uh, too much, but also making sure we continue to advance the project, continue to showcase what we have, continue to unlock more, more mineralization, grow the project. Um, and, uh, you know, when we have uh, tailwinds on, on the equity side, you know, the, the metal is in, heading in the right direction. And now we need the equities to, to follow suit. And, um, you know, and, and when that comes, um, you know, things could uh, could move quickly. So, you know, you were mentioning that, you know, our share price is down 80% from, from its highs. Uh, so two years ago, we're trading at $1.48. We have since drilled 40,000 meters with a very high uh, success ratio. Um, and, um, you know, very few things have received love in terms of on the equity space in the market. Um, so this will eventually uh, turn around and uh, when uh, when we get uh, you know to a more normal I, I would say equity equity equities environment with a, in a in the junior mining or gold mining space um, I think we'll be able to accelerate and advance this project much faster um, and eventually things could come up all at the same time we're, we're waiting for an MA cycle to start as well on the gold space um, we know that in five, six years, that's going to be a big uh, production cliff from the majors in the mid tiers. Um, we really haven't seen that uh, M&A cycle getting started. You said a we saw a couple of interesting deals. I, I really enjoy the, the caliber deal with Marathon. I think it was very smart, mm. especially for the caliber shareholders. Um, so, um, you know, maybe maybe we'll see more of these uh, single asset producers or, or or kind of smaller junior producers um, coming and steal uh, the mid tiers in the majors lunch. Um, yeah, yeah, that'd be interesting to see. Oh, you're right. This has been a good conversation. Um, I'm I'm happy we sat down. Hopefully, we can pick it up in a couple of months and just go through a lot of the uh, stuff that we talked about today. As a, as if like. If it happened, maybe by then it's a sort of a when question as opposed to an if question. But yeah, it was very nice talking to you, Marco. What am I? Uh, what am I forgetting to ask you though? What did, what did you come here hoping to talk about, but I'm failing to bring up? Uh, well, I, I think we talked about a lot of things. I um, I think in terms of uh, of our project, you know, a, a few things that uh, I mean, you mentioned some of our shareholders. I, I guess I guess I, I really encourage people to to have a look at what we have, look at our presentation, and reach out. In addition to have, you know, we have a few more institutional shareholders. Uh, we've been adding, basically, we brought that from zero four years ago to, uh, you know, almost 30% right now. Uh, been adding a lot of uh, good institutional names, but we also have a really well-rounded and, and seriously successful board and, and, uh, and uh, management team that has, you know, basically discovered, built, operated, sold mines all over the world. Um, and we also have the social license to operate, which is uh, mm -hmm. something we haven't touched that, uh, here, but it's, um, uh, I think, you know, a big risk for any mining project. And on that front, uh, you know, I couldn't be happier with, with the relationship we have with our community. We're very supportive. They're very supportive of us. Um, and yeah, I, I just welcome anyone to feel free to reach out. I'm more than happy to, um, 
you know, showcase and, and ask, answer any, any questions to, to either to you or any of your listener, uh, listeners that are, you know, tuning in right now. All right, staying in uh, BC here, but moving a little bit to the south, specifically to the Golden Triangle, where I'm talking to Sean Kunkun, the CEO of Dolly Varden Silver. The company is listed on a TSX Ventures Exchange under the ticker symbol DV, where an average of about 200,000 shares straight each day with a 52-week high of $1.24 and a 52-week low of $0.64. Cents. With a market cap of about 217, that's $17 million, and 270 million shares outstanding, that's seven zero. Today, this is an 80 cent stock. There are almost 13 million options. There are no warrants, though, and all that results in about 283 million fully diluted shares. There is um, no significant insider ownership, but there is a strong insider uh, institutional, excuse me, ownership. Um, matter of fact, there's mostly that, if you could. Um, you know, if you could call F uh, Fury Gold Mines and uh, uh, um, Institutional and Heckler in there as well, because they own 15 and 22% um, respectively, or the other way around. I'll have to double check, but it, it's among those numbers. Whereas Sprott, US Global, uh, Delbrook, and Fidelity own another 47% of the company. And then Eric Sprott himself, so the man, not the company, he also owns 9% of Dolly Varden, leaving about 7% in the hands of retail and uh, high net worth individuals. Now, as of last, uh, as of the last financial statement, which is dated September 30, the company had seven million dollars in current assets and about half and a, five and a half of which, by the way, is in actual cash, uh, and that sat against short-term account payables and accrued liabilities of about 2.7 million dollars. In that same statement, covering the first nine months of last fiscal year, we can see that Dolly spent on average about 350 thousand dollars per month on general and administrative expenses. And about $2.5 million a month, um, again, on average, on exploration and evaluation. And the main part of that was actually drilling. So $1.5 million, you know, on average, was actual drilling costs, leaving the exploration to GNA ratio with about seven, which means that about 82% of the money spent over that period went into actual exploration. Please do head over to the company's website as well, setterplus.ca, though, because you will have to look at the numbers for yourself and see if there have been any changes by the time you're watching this, because again, this is a non-revenue generating company that relies on the public market for financing um, its its general activities. And uh, there was also, by the way, just it's just been a five, uh, fifteen million dollar bot deal charity flow through financing, which is uh, something I hope can be discussed later on as well. Boring numbers aside, though, after acquiring one of its neighbors' project in 2022 for about 40 million bucks, Dolly Varden now holds 163 square kilometers of land in the southern tip of the Golden Triangle in BC. There's a resource on these um, on these two projects combined uh, that houses 34.7 million ounces of silver and 166, let's call it, thousand ounces of gold in the indicated category. And then there's another 29.2 or 0.3 million ounces of silver, as well as 1,808, they wish, 816 million ounces of gold in the inferred category of the NI43101. That's across all categories, means that it's 64 million ounces of silver and almost a million ounces of gold, which at today's prices, judging by value of the NC2 metal, uh, this resource is about 42% silver. Again, all of that uh, split over two projects within um, multiple separate deposits on each project with the Dolly Varden project holding four known deposits, um, which is also where most of the mineralization is across both categories. Mineralization here occurs in veins and it's hosted in volcano sedimentary rocks, which might sound a bit confusing to those who remember their rock cycle because typically sedimentary rocks are their own thing and they really are. Uh, only in this case, they're... Uh, piece of peer pressure has been disturbed by volcanic activity if you will basically a long time ago volcanoes erupted close to where sediment is or so rivers and seas and lakes and whatnot which is disturbing um for the rocks basically but good for creating pathways for mineralization in this case you can sort of if you want to talk about in barbecue terms you can imagine uh what's happened here at sort of a, a barbecue party for aquaman if you will so my man Jason Momoa was was throwing a party uh, on the ocean floor, and then the ocean floor started cracking and faulting, essentially creating uh, vents, like kind of like a vents of a grill, if you will. 
And um, while they were all partying, those cracks and folds in the ocean floor led up what geologists would call hydrothermal solutions, but I call it barbecue sauce, bubbling up from below and bringing in minerals with it, basically, which then started interacting with the surrounding rocks on the upper layers. And so infusing those sedimentary rocks, if you will, with the barbecue sauce or the gold and silver in this case. Now, why is this important to understand is because that's apparently more or less how SK Creek's deposit was formed, which is not too far away from here. So it helps Dolly Varden's geos uh, come up with an exploration strategy and, and manage their exploration strategy, basically. Now, the newly acquired Homestake Ridge project, on the other hand, also contains copper and lead next to the gold and silver, which are dispersed in three known deposits in this case. And the main idea over here over the last couple of years has really been to expand those four known deposits at Dolly Varden and those three known deposits at Homestake by connecting the Wolf and Torbid Kitzel zones under the sediment cap, basically. Uh, there's been over 50,000 meters that was drilled in 2023, so you know to better understand that whole system, with some um, recent assays from Homestake showing that a new gold ridge zone was uh, intersected to the northwest from the silver deposit with some relatively high grades that um, actually, on some some occasions, do look a bit nuggety, but something that again I hope to hear more about later on. Um, for now, though, Sean, and now it's on to you. I want to kick it off with um, a, a bit of strategy talk here, if you will, because you you've got many ways to advance this thing forward, right? You can now do more M and around you. You can find a buyer for what you already have consolidated. You can look to go to a PEA this year. You can say no PEA before at least another fifty thousand meters of drilling or probably a half a dozen other options that I'm not thinking about right now. So what's uh, what's the way forward here that you think will result in, in, as they say, shareholder value, but really the share price going up? Well, first of all, I just want to say that was a very, uh, very good summary in terms of uh, great overview. Uh, a couple of things I just want to, uh, to mention, because, um, you know, you referenced our cash position as of September 30th, which is what you're working with in terms of public information. I think there uh, would have been a subsequent event, though, in those financial statements, which was a $10 million funding in October with Hecla, mm -hmm. And that's where Hecla took went from 10% to 15%. And then we do have, uh, we announced a bought deal financing, which we're closing this week for another 15 million. So net net, um, we're going to be sitting on about 23 million in, in the bank. And right. I just wanted to, just wanted to, to let your viewers know in an, in an environment where capital has been quite scarce for the sector, um, you know, where we're armed with 23 million in the bank in terms of strategy, I come from a world where I've been working with junior mining companies for 20 years. And um, I think the greatest value creation is through exploration. Typically, like if you can find high quality, you know, economic mineable ounces through drilling, um, you need to leverage that. And that's what we're doing. So our main focus in terms of driving value for shareholders is with the drill bit. Um, but as you stated, you know, we have been known to do m a we have been known to be acquisitive we are in an environment right now where we've got historically low valuations um so on a on a price to net asset value basis our peers are trading at 0.2 um and and you know typically in, in bull markets they could trade at one or, or two times nav and we're trading at you know 20% of NAV. So there is an opportunity for Dolly Varden to leverage our 0.46 valuation and, and, and look at accretive M&A opportunities. The bottom line is to really simplify my strategy. And the, the reason the team has been able to drive this company's value from 20 million to 200 million in the last four years at a time where the sector is falling is we're focused on growing our mineral inventory. And we're doing that through exploration and we're doing that also through acquisition. Mm. You mentioned that there's that's where you create shareholder value through the drill bid. But I'm wondering whether there's may maybe a point where it's no longer as efficient to keep drilling in terms of shareholder capital. What I mean by that is that, and I'm always careful how, how I go about valuing pounds or ounces in the ground because it's not always a fair comparison. Um, not a straightforward comparison in, in, in many many times, but we can just use it as an example here. Um, you now trade at what about a buck forty Canadian per ounce in the ground if we count everything up together. What do deposits like this typically sell for? Like, what's a realistic number? First of all, 
per ounce in the ground. And second of all, what about the size? Like how big would this have to be in order to get sort of the full potential um, potential valuation that you're thinking about? Mm -hmm. So you, you said a lot of very intelligent things right there, and I want I want to touch on them. So there is the the risk of like the law of diminishing returns in terms of you know it's one thing when a company first starts drilling out an ore body, but once like let's let's say let's say you've got a target size of a five million ounce gold deposit, and let's say you know during those first stages of exploration, as you get eighty percent of the way there, you're creating a lot of value, but if you've got to spend $20 million to get the last million ounces of gold and you're not getting credited with that, is it, does it make sense to keep going? And I, I'd say, I'd argue for Dolly Varden, it's really only been in the last two seasons where we've had a meaningful amount of exploration work and some big breakthroughs. So I would argue that there is still a season or two ahead of us where I think we can still, you know, drive a lot of value through drilling. Yeah. Um, and and I love your point about not all ounces are created equal. And I think it's it's a it's something where investors don't appreciate that. They don't understand the nuances. And so I think it's a wonderful point you're making. But in terms of you know where we need to go, I believe we're already there. I think we could we could put the drills down today. And we've got a project that's large enough, it's high grade enough, it's in the right, right location. And, um, but I, again, I think there's like, when I look at the area and the area has got a rich history, you've got, you know, you mentioned SK Creek, but beyond SK, you've got the premier mine. You know, the premier mine, when it was operating in the 1920s, initially, it went on to operate, you know, decades beyond that. But it initially it was, the best gold mine on the planet when it was operating in the 30s. And um, it produced uh, about 2 million ounces of high-grade gold and 45 million ounces of high-grade silver. Um, but there's a, there's a theme there with Premier, with Bruce Jack, with SK Creek. All three are some of the most famous, richest gold and silver mines on the planet. Okay? Um, you no, know, Nobody can argue that. Um and my point is, they all started as high-grade silver deposits. And then as the explorers, the companies got closer to the heat source, some of the greatest gold deposits the planet had ever seen were discovered. If you look at how Dolly Varn fits into that parallel, you know, not only is it in the same location, is it the same mineralizing event, the SK Rift, but moreover, what started as a high-grade silver deposit We've now just drilled into a new gold zone. And that new gold zone um, is it, it it's it's got our shareholders extremely excited. It is the reason we were able to, um, you know, Eric Sprott has not been extremely active over the last 12 months in the sector. If you compare his activities today to what they were, say, five years ago, yet Eric led our financing which we just put up about a week or so ago. And there, and I think the reason for that, whether it's Eric, whether it's Hecla, whether it's his other institutions you mentioned, we are finding something that is quite unique. And um, so again, like it's it, in exploration, you don't, you don't want to plan, like, you know, you want to be able to be quick on your toes. You want to be able to be able to adjust to what you're seeing and, and be nimble. And um, so what I've got in front of me here is a 30,000 meter drill program that's fully financed and then some. And let's see how big this new new target is, this new gold zone is. And I think for investors, what I love about Dolly Varden is number one, how many primary silver opportunities are there out there? There's, there's, there's not a lot. It, it only represents like, um, 28% of silver, the silver market, you know, 72% of silver comes as a byproduct. So that leaves, if you want to get exposure to silver, and I think, I believe, you know, you look at the set, setup for silver right now, there, there's not a better setup for any other metal under the sun. And I think silver is going to vastly outperform every other metal moving forward here. And so if you're looking for primary silver mines, first of all, they're hard to come by. What makes Dolly so unique is it's a primary silver mine in a safe jurisdiction. 
So you've got that, you've got the validation of all these incredible investors. You, you asked, you know, you know, what, what, what is our goal? Is it a takeover? Is it, you know, we've been subject to a hostile takeover in the past, uh, actually two. And, um, the company has managed to stay independent, but the but now that our valuation's up ten times in the last four years since the new team has taken over uh, that I lead, um, you know, at some point in the future, maybe we support uh, and you know being acquired, or maybe if the market stays depressed, we continue being the acquirer, mm -hmm. and uh, that's been a path to our growth. So I just think, look, my focus is number one, making my shareholders money. Number two, doing the next right thing that's in front of me. If I continue to do those two things, I'm going to continue to outperform our peers. You know, our peers were down um, 30% last year. You know, we were, we were up 7%. So that is on a relative basis, you know, we're outperforming by 37%. We're doing that because we've got a highly prospective project We've got an incredible team. We're well-funded by shareholders that are giving us time to build a business. And, um, you know, and you know this because you watch a lot of these types of companies. Look, the reality is in this sector, most companies fail. The ones that win, you've got to stick with, you know, like there's a saying in our industry, you make your money averaging up, meaning, when you've got something that's working, if you continue to invest in it, right, that's where the big money's made in our sector. Hmm. Uh, that's a lesson I have to learn myself because I like catching falling knives typically. But good point. There's um you um you're not putting down the drills though today, as you said at the beginning, because you have twenty three million dollars in the treasury right now you can do a thirty thousand meter drill program how um how are you going to split those thirty thousand meters like how, what goes into home stake what goes into dolly varden so we got 23 million in the bank Thirty thousand meters in this part of the world all in is going to cost us about 12 million dollars so we'll have a lot of treasury after the drill program hmm. um the way of you know the way the team um has designed the program is a third of the, of the of the meterage, so about 10,000 meters being allocated to the new discovery. So we just hit 12 meters of 80 grams of gold outside of the resource, brand new gold zone. Uh, within that, there was about a 1.3 kilo gold hit, 1,335 grams per ton. So we're gonna take 10,000 meters and we're gonna see if that um, zone has legs. We're gonna see how big it is. That zone, is in the middle of a high grade silver zone and a big gold zone called Homestake, Homestake Main and Homestake Silver. We stepped out and right underneath the, the system, we hit this gold zone. So a third of the drill meters are going there. Um, five kilometers south, we've got a deposit called Wolf. And Wolf has really been something that the projects needed for a long time, which is a brand new big high grade silver to, to discovery. And this deposit is a kilometer and a half away from a really big silver mine on the property called Torbrit. So Torbrit produced 19 million ounces of silver at around 500 grams per ton. And Torbrit's got 43, 43 101 compliant, about 35 million ounces of silver. Okay, at about 300 grams per ton. Plus there's been some new discoveries that haven't been updated into a new MRE. So a kilometer and a half away, Wolf has gone from being this discrete little surface showing to 900 meters of strike length. It's looking like it could run, it could be the next Torbrit. So a third of the drill meters will go into coming up with a 43101 compliant resource at the Wolf deposit, okay? And so you got a third of the drilling going to chase this new high grade discovery in gold. You've got a third of the drilling gonna, gonna add ounces to the MRE high grade silver ounces. And, um, and then we've got a third plan for what I would describe as regional exploration. So this is a project where we've got a 15 kilometer trend. Every kilometer and a half, there seems to be an, a, another break. Okay, and another deposit. 
So we want to follow up and see how many more wolves and torbrits and homestakes there are along this 15 kilometer trend. So far, we've identified seven major deposits and there are gaps in the periodicity where you've got five kilometer gaps where there hasn't been any exploration. But when we start to do exploration, we found something called the moose deposit. So we want to follow up. Is moose the next wolf? Um, so we've got a ton of regional targets to follow up on. And um, but again, my experience 20 years in this business has taught me that plans can change. We might get up to to home stake and it could could be really significant and decide we want to allocate more meters. We may and we've got the treasury where we could say, you know what, let's go to 50,000 meters. Mm -hmm. And this has been a particularly warm year. So we're, we're going to get started earlier. We're going to drill longer and um, this could be one of our biggest drill programs ever. As long as moose remains moose and doesn't become moose pasture, uh, I, I think <laughs> people will be happy. But what if so? You're saying 23 million bucks, 12 million bucks. That program leaves you with 11, four to four and a half GNA is what I assume. You're also just budgeting kind of the same like last year. Leaves you with six and a half to seven million bucks. That's the optionality. Yeah. And I got to say one thing. I, I loved your analysis when you started the call and you talked about like an 82 percent uh, ratio of mm. money going into the ground versus on other things. The reality is it's it's about 88 percent. And um, some of what you're looking at, they're actually um, expenditures. But I'll, I'll give you an example. So I've got some scientists that are here to find ounces. But if they're talking to an investor, that's got to go into the marketing category versus the exploration category. So we, you know, we take a very, very conservative approach. So it's probably closer to 90% of the money is actually going towards um, advancing the project right. versus, versus lawyers, accountants, and making sure that the, the wonderful work and results that we're getting are being recognized by industry. Right. That's that's a, a difficult one for me. What I typically tend to do is look at only the money that goes into drilling, although that's not fair because there's a bunch of other money, as you said, around it that gets spent that are also potentially adding to the value of the project. Example, but there's shenanigans example, yeah. around it, right? I mean, there's for, sometimes... For, oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, for example, um, if I, you know, like I, I do a lot of things that... Um, create an environment for success, right? And uh, and some of those things, you know, don't get um, allocated as an exploration expenditure, um, but lead to, a, you know, a, an environment where people perform well in the field. You know, for example, you know, I think we spent $5,000 on bringing some weights to have them up at site. Okay. So the people at site, you know, they get to stay fit. They get to stay healthy. They, it's like they're at home, you know, like, so you, you got to do these things. So um, when it comes to shenanigans, we're, we're light on shenanigans here, but, um, and, and, and again, uh, we, it's, it's moose and um, we'll, we'll, we're there to, to drill these targets or kill them. And if, if it is like you said, moose pasture, we're happy to move on and go to the other 93 occurrences to follow up on. Mm. You also mentioned that you're going to start early this year. What does that mean specifically, me? Yeah, like that's a, that's really so. You know, for instance, um, you know, we we just took a trip up to site in uh, in early March, which is totally unusual. Normally, we'd never go to project till May, and we were already up there in March, and there's very little snow, and um, so. I, I just this could this could be a year where it's a much 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 longer season. Yeah, interesting. But how long is it going to take you if you start in May? How long is it going to take you to do those twelve thousand meters? Uh the thirty thousand meters we have planned, like uh, thirty. I'm sorry, I was thinking twelve million bucks. You're right, thirty. Um, you know, look, it's it it all depends on. You know, like if we wanted to, we could get 30,000 meters done. Like, you know, it's just a, it's a question of how many rigs do you want to bring? How do you want the exploration? So, you know, like a company, we, we could probably accomplish 150,000 meters of drilling in a calendar year at the 
We could drill year round if we wanted to, but you know, um, our approach has been to try to do things in a way where we're surgical, you know, we're getting our eyes on the core, we're able to make the right decisions. And uh, again, you know, what I envision is to us to start drilling in May and, um, and just, you know, being methodical, being surgical. And then if we're having success and things are going well, we can add rigs. Uh, last year was a year, for example, we started with three rigs turning in the initial program. Uh, we had planned 42,000 meters of drilling and then things were going efficiently. The, the targets were responding. Um, so we added a fourth rig um, and then we added a fifth rig. And by the end of this, it we had drilled 10,000 more meters than we had originally budgeted and forecasted. And um, so, you know, those things can happen upon success. Right. Fair. And, um, and, and, yeah. that, 50, and that 51,000 meters was accomplished in four months, just to okay. give you to give you some context, right? So, um, you know, you, you know, and again, this is a project that you can drill year round. We choose to go at a time where, you know, we're most efficient because the, the shorter you have camp open, the less costs you have, right? So if we can do things when it's optimal daylight, optimal weather, you know, it we can reduce cost. Right. Fair. Okay. It's uh, wh why I'm asking this because I'm trying to sort of understand where assays might be coming in. So I'm thinking end, end, end of June, beginning of so, July. So traditionally, um, Dolly Varden has reported first assays first week of August, traditionally. If you look back to previous years, that's typically. So I think the earliest you can expect something would be July. Hmm. Okay. What do you think? This might sound like a vague question, but maybe you can get a little bit more specific on it. But what would success look like for this drill program? And let me tell you why I'm asking you this, because I'm wondering if you're successful, what does that mean in terms of your relationship with Hecla or Fury or, or their ownership in the company? So I think success is demonstrating size and grade and continuity and you know, if we could demonstrate that, you know, we're, you know, we're adding, you know, it's just going to increase the the value of this project. So what success looks like to me is to continue to step out and continue to show that these deposits are, are, are growing um, in, in some cases like Wolf, they're intensifying in terms of grade as we drill it to depth. Um, and uh, in the case of Homestake Silver, and Homestake, Maine, the continuity is much stronger than we had originally um, modeled. So, you know, success, like, listen, if it's not broken, don't fix it. And we have had in it, like just a, a fairy tale in terms of results for the last three years. Like if you look at, if you think about Dolly Varden, like some of the numbers that come to mind, you know, 15 meters of 1500 grams of silver, um, 45 grams of gold over 25 meters. Uh, you know, you look at some of these results that we've had, you know, recently 93 meters of 357 grams of silver, you know, I'm, as I mentioned, 12 meters, 80 grams of gold. These are like world class results. And so success to me is to keep in the spirit of the recent two seasons and more of the same. That's what success is. Now, um, Fury uh, is an, you know, after this financing will be a 19% shareholder. Okay. Um, so Fury is a 19% shareholder. Um, I think they really believe in this project and they want to maintain as much ownership. They want to maintain as much of that 19% for the conclusion of the Dolly Varden story, which I think in their eyes would be an eventual sale to a larger entity. In the case of Hecla, Hecla is a corporate miner. They're the fast, they're the world's fastest growing established silver miner. Right. And they're interested in securing future silver for them to mine. Mm -hmm. And I think Dolly Varden, they're interested in Dolly Varden because Dolly Varden is silver and Dolly Varden's in Canada, period. Right. And 
Hecla is so encouraged by what we're doing that they've increased their stake in the company from 10% to 15%. So I think if we continue in the spirit of, like I said, having the type of success we had in the last two seasons, unless there's something that fundamentally changes in their business, I would suspect they're going to continue to be shareholders and continue to, um, to support the company. And do, do this, they continue to support the company if you have success, but at what point do they become interested in, in trying to take you out, basically? Which goes to the first question that we talked about. Uh, that's sort of what I was getting at. Like, Can this year's drill program be that much of a success that it triggers a, a takeover offer from one of your strategics? So look, the way I, the way I look at um, our business is um, the way larger companies grow is by acquiring smaller companies, mm. right? But you need to have certain conditions. Like there's there's different times in a cycle where M and A activity picks up, and you know, and so I don't think we're at a time in the cycle where you're seeing a flurry of little M&A activity, where you've got a, a numerous amount of mid-tier companies that are doing a flurry of M&A. I think that happens later in a cycle. And I think that's a good thing for shareholders because, you know, number one, it's all relative because a lot of these deals are share deals and you're getting the acquiring company stock. And so later in a cycle, the acquiring company is worth a lot more than they are at the start of a cycle. So it's all relative, but, um, you know, look, I think what I look at is um, enterprise value per ounce is a great metric to look at. Um, and, and, you know, when I took over Dolly, we were trading at about 40 cents U.S. dollars an ounce, and now we're trading at a dollar. Um, I think these ounces are worth five, six, seven dollars USD per ounce on the ground. And, um, and we've got a lot more ounces than we did four years ago. Um, you know, with the acquisition of Homestake, we added on a silver equivalent basis, about 100 million ounces of silver EQ. So we've got about 140, we've got 140 million ounces of silver EQ. We've added a lot of ounces at Wolf. We've increased our confidence in the ounces. You talked about not ounces, all ounces are created equal. A big majority of our silver ounces are in the measured and indicated category, not the inferred category. And I think what we've done with our gold ounces is we've converted a lot of our um, inferred gold ounces. So I think on a new MRE in the future, I think you're going to see the ounces grow and you're going to see the ounces move categories into mm -hmm. a higher confidence. And so I really think because of the grade, because of the location, these will yield, a you know, 300 to 500 percent more value than they're currently trading and i think we're still adding ounces so i i don't i think it's in our it, like the longer we stay independent the more value we're going to get for this project hmm. so you i'm know, not i'm not in a rush to sell it yeah that's typically a case in venture capital i i, I get that part interesting though you should mention seven bucks an ounce um where like that's what you think but where is that coming from that belief Okay, let's go back a few years and look at it. Like, first of all, I, I, I want to—I I don't think there's an appreciation to how rare silver is, okay, or where we're going to get silver. And you know, you look at it like we're mining. I think it's something in the magnitude of about 1.2 billion silver ounces a year. Okay, so we're mining, we're adding 1.2 billion silver ounces. Um, there's an appetite for about a billion and a half silver ounces on an annual basis. So there's a deficit. Okay. There's a deficit. Deficits are usually good for price. And that's why we've seen the silver price go from $16 an ounce to $25 an ounce in the last couple of years. Okay. If you go back to a time where silver was $16 an ounce, there was a little company called Silvercrest that was trading at around eight or $9 per silver ounce in the ground at a time when the silver price was about 16 bucks an ounce, okay? Why was it trading at that price when a company like Dolly Varden was trading at 40 cents? What's the, with the discrepancy? It's about size. It's about um, the economics. It's about the grade. And it's about, you know, how profitable this company is going to be when it goes into production in the case of Silvercrest. So 
uh, you know, but you know, forgetting the one Silvercrest example, forget the forget that. Let's go back to the average in situ value in 2011. Okay, the value in 2011 was three dollars per third three dollars and thirty cents per silver ounce across the board. These are uneconomic. You know, a, a mile down, twenty gram ounces in Bolivia. Okay. On average, $3.30. That's where silver trades in a bull market. Um, now, my argument is what $3 would buy you 10 years ago is not what $3 buys you today. Okay? So uh, I think the average in this coming market will probably be $5. A company like Dolly Varn could trade at 10 hmm. But again... If we just take the last cycle and we look at $3 and you multiply that by what we have in the ground that today, you know, that's a market cap that's two and a half times greater than we're currently trading. And that doesn't account for any of the discoveries we've made recently, um, nor does it account for where I really think the in-situ value for these projects will be. Hmm. To get double the market average, though, you would still have to a lot of other boxes will have to be checked, uh, like permits and the locals and, and everything else. Uh, metallurgy is one of the things that pops to mind too. Have you Are, are you going to be doing any more uh, metallurgy work this year? So um, you, you mentioned a couple of things there, and I want to touch on all of them. So we're, we're in BC. Um, so BC, from when Bruce Jack really turned on its exploration, to when it started pouring gold, it was seven years. So that is construction, that is permitting, that is like, you know, drilling out the resource, that is bringing power. That was a hundred million dollar power line, the Northwest transmission line, all in seven years. It was incredible. Mm -hmm. And so my point is BC permits mines. You know, um, Artemis just got a permit, uh, Premier is going to be pouring like so BC, you've got certainty, you've got certainty, you, you use the term locals. Um, our locals are the Nishka. They've got modern treaties, there's certainty, a third of our workforce. So in terms of permitting, it's it's BC Canada, it's certainty with Taltan and Nishka. Um, and uh, and what was your, your other question? I was just actually going into a completely different topic, but it was about metallurgy and what you're doing oh, in yeah, metallurgy, metallurgy work metallurgy. this year. Because our project is a past producer, not only do we have the modern metallurgical testing that was done in 2019 and 2020, and what's crazy about this project is like most of these silver projects, you know, they're, they're low recoveries. They're like 60%, 70% because there's lead and zinc. Because of the nature of our, our deposit. We've got 87, 88% silver recoveries. And not only do we have the modern metallurgical work that we did in 2019, but we also have all the old production records from the 50s, from the 20s, to, to give us a lot of confidence in those numbers. And on the gold side up at Homestake uh, in 2020, the metallurgical work was reported and the gold recoveries were in the low 90 percentile. Mm. Base metal grades are, grades are picking up, though, at Homestake Ridge. Do you think that's going to hurt recoveries? Um, so where I'm seeing base metals pick up is at the Wolf deposit. So the average silver grade we're getting was about 300 grams per ton. As we go a little bit deeper, we just kicked into the super rich uh, lead zinc zone, which took the silver EQ grade to 460 from 300. And um, I haven't done the metallurgical work there to give you an, an answer, number one. Uh, number two, at home stake, um, well, there's copper in the system. And so when the metallurgical work was done, it was accounted for. So I feel very confident in the 91, 92% recoveries we have at home stake. Okay, fair point. Are you doing any of that? Uh, are you going up there and doing any work this year? So there was three holes that were drilled in 23 and um, we're just finalizing uh, the results from that metallurgical work. And, and some of that was more around combining uh, the Dolly ore and the home stake ore to see what the recoveries would be. 
Oh, you mean total? So it's not necessarily home stake alone. It's it's sort of a over the two. Okay, fair. Um, what, is there a royalty by the way? Because you mentioned past producer. Um, is there a royalty left from those times on the project? So, like this, what you have to appreciate is we consolidated fifteen kilometers, right? And there was dozens and dozens and dozens of little owners, and and so. The way to simplify the answer is the whole package is subject to uh, NSR and we'll, we'll call it like roughly about a 2% NSR, but there are some claims that are not subject to it, but let's just say where the main deposits are, we've got a 2% NSR, which is pretty standard. Okay. And, and, and again, my goal is to, um, to reduce that to zero and to try to, to buy those back. But at this point um, we just factor in a, a 2% NSR to underlying prospectors. You came in later in the story. It's been four years, I want to say, since you came in-ish. Um, so I don't I came, assume... I, I, came, I came in 100 years into the story because essentially silver was discovered in like 1904 in the area and production started in 1920. And so I came in in 2020. Uh, so okay. I came in a hundred years, but um, jokes aside, like this iteration of Dolly Varden Corporation was taken public on February of 2012. So I came in eight years into this modern opportunity. So yeah, right. four years ago. You came, you, you brought a public on your, on your daughter's birthday, which is kind of ballsy too. I think my wife would throw me out the house if no, I did no, that. No, 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 That was a coincidence. So, so, so a previous management team happened to bring the company public and okay. it was happened to be the day my daughter was born. Oh. Eight years after the fact, I took over as CEO. Okay. But you mean in the current situation? Okay. I get it. Yeah. That was a, a, a kind of a, a blank out moment for me there, but no, I watched, I watched your interview on the gold newsletter uh, channel with Kai Hoffman, which is also good, by the way. So shout out to Kai here. But um, that's where I came from with this. So it was kind of a fun factoid. Um, okay, but I, so well, why I brought that up is because I don't think you own any of the royalties personally. Uh, but do any of the other key management figures own it personally, or who owns it? Um, no, no, gosh, no. Uh, and if we were, that would be disclosed in financial statements. I actually did something that I'm really proud of, actually, when I took over the company. Um, about a year into it, I brought back um, some surface rights and claims and within Dolly Varden Silver Corp purchased, um, essentially giving us control of the waterfront in Alisar. So we really, in addition, to, and I got the special use permit on the road. So, we, you know, we've got the waterfront, we've got the road. Um, in terms of the royalties, the royalties are held by um, the previous um, vendor of the project. And they're, and they're different entities for the Dolly Varden and for Homestake. Okay. Yeah. No, they're just checking this kind of like... A little check box of mine. Um, I do. I know you don't have all day here, but I did want to talk a little bit about the geology, specifically about grade variability. Um, worth talking about in in some of the recent drilling, basically. Um, some of it appears nuggety. What are the What are the geos telling you about this? Um, about the potential for n a nuggety system here. Well, I think that the nuggets make the project pay. Um, you know what I mean. So what I mean by that is in both the case of whether you're looking at the Dolly Varn side of the project or the homesick part of the project, you know, in the case of the Dolly side, I thought you gave a great um, example about the seafloor bottom, right. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and sort of how it, the area was mineralized. And so what I'd like your viewers and yourself to, to imagine is this consistent 200 gram material um, that's averaging 200 gram silver bulk mineable, you know, um, nice, nicely disseminated over, you know, 30, 40, 50 meters of width. So something that's amenable to bulk mining, something that's very consistent, and it's 200 grams per ton. Now, what's happened, though, is there's been another event where you had an epithermal overprint bringing in kilo grades of silver. So it's, it takes the average grade from 200 to 300. 
So if it wasn't for that, you know, epithermal high grade overprint, I don't know if this project would be economic, mm. you know, with, with today's silver prices, but it's, it's bringing, it's having that nice, a disseminated area that's grading 200 with the epithermal overprint that kicks up the grade that that in my opinion makes it economic. Now up at home stake, it's similar in that you've got a consistent multi-gram gold background, like a halo. Okay. But then in different parts of this the system, you get these, you know, you, you get these breccia pulses that bring in you know, 700 gram gold, uh, 1500 gram gold. And that takes that average of a few gram background, you know, over, you know, it could be a hundred or 200 meters of multi-gram. And then you get this enrichment that takes the overall grade. And that's why, you know, we, we didn't present the last drill results as 60 meters of 15 grams of gold, we presented it because we don't think that's going to be, that's how you're going to mine it. You know, what? how we presented it was 12 meters of 80 grams. And so look, I think it's a risk in the golden triangle. Um, you know, the, you know, the golden triangle has a storied history of grade, but does grade meet tonnage? And I think that's the, that's the question that all the projects in the Golden Triangle are trying to answer, and um, and we're no different. And you know, you look at Bruce Jack; that was a major risk at Bruce Jack. If you go back to, you know, some of the stated grades and their feasibility versus what they're actually mining, and that's why I think you know you really, and that's why we we focus so much on grade at Dolly Varden, is because we understand that in this part of the world you do need exceptional grades. Mm. Is it, I think it's also important to, or at least for me, uh, and I'm not a geo, so give me some rope here, but it's it's important to understand what the what's driving that concentration. And also maybe more importantly, is it random, as in those pockets of high grade? Are they, is there a pattern within the orientation or the dip of the veins or zoning or clusters or association with certain minerals, something that can tell you where those high grade zones are hiding, or is it just randomly dispersed? You know, in, in like, and I've worked all over Canada, you know, from uh, New Brunswick all the way to Yukon and, you know, er, almost every province in between. And, and the key for every project is trying to identify those patterns or those elements or those, you know, those indicator minerals of what's creating that. And then trying to look at other parts of the project to replicate it, right? And um, you know, in the case of Dolly Varden and the case of our silver mineralization, it was the relationship between potassium and sodium depletion, and that was coincident um, to where we we're finding silver. So th there has been some incredible work done to um to to vector into those areas and to to understand um some of the indicators and some of the patterns and understand but also then you you know as important is something as simple as structure mm -hmm. yeah so but it, it, it's mostly lithology like it's not vein morphology or alteration patterns that you think is driving this it's different you know, because again, we're talking about such a large is 163 square kilometer land position with, you know, porphyry style mineralization and, uh, you know, VMS style mineralization and, you know, like it's, you've got a hodgepodge and, and at the end of the day, you know, for me, it's let's, where do you have a, where do you have some mineralization? Where's it open? Let's try to expand and extend it. It's that simple. Right. It, it, and it, it sounds like I know what I'm talking about. I'm barely hanging on here. But what I'm trying to better understand here is, how, first of all, how is this going to be managed throughout the exploration process, which, you, which is what you're telling me right now, so that as as fewer holes as possible come back barren, basically, but oh. also in the context of eventually, potentially mining this thing. I'd like to better understand, the, obviously, the potential ore dilution and the strip ratio. So is that something you can talk to me about, something you guys have already looked into? 
Well, I just wanted to say in terms of managing the exploration side, you know, triangulating exploration in, in, in terms of looking at the geology, looking at the geochemistry, looking at the geophysics, and kind of looking at it from a holistic standpoint of, you know, identifying and looking at all the historic information because some of these some of these um, targets, some of these deposits, some of these mines, we've got some incredible historic information and and bringing that all in. But you know, if you really want to take a uh, you know a deep scientific dive, I think you, you know we should probably have. Uh, my my VPX Rob Van Egmont come on and uh, and walk you through his his rationale. That would definitely be be welcome. Although I would also absolutely be outbrained, but maybe he can talk to me as if I'm five years old. What is um what else is um what else is worth talking about here? I'm I'm, I'm thinking about how you're going to be following everything up. We talked about that. We talked about the new high grade gold zone, uh, gold rich zone, if you will. Um. What else am I? Uh, what else am, should I be asking about here in terms of geology? I think, I think like what is what is your goal? And I think what your goal is is to try to provide the audience with an in depth opportunity to get to know Dolly Varden. And I just think you know at a very very high level, Dolly Varden is one of three companies in the world that is giving investors. Um, exposure to a high growth silver opportunity, you know, and you've got, you know, like to me, it checks every box. Like I'm a, I'm an, I'm an avid, active, successful resource investor. And the reason that I'm the CEO of Dolly Varden is because you've got a 43 101 compliant, high grade, large resource in a safe jurisdiction. And you've got the validation of all the big shareholders like Eric Sprott, like Hecla, like the institutions. Uh, you got, look at the board, look at the management, look at the history. Why is it this company is growing and having success? So I just think, look, I think you take all those factors in and uh, it should lead to a positive outcome in the future, which I think with this company is defining a saleable project and that sale and, and demonstrating that saleable opportunity leads to shareholder value, and in this case, I think it leads to a takeover. You say that you're an avid resource investor, and in a, a presentation, it must have been a VRIC or something like that. I heard you say that Dolly Varden was a must-own name, uh, but as I mentioned at the beginning, there is no significant insider ownership. So, if this is a must-own name, are you planning on buying it on on the open market this year yourself? So look, when you're when you okay, when you're typically launching a new venture, you know, mm. um, a management team could easily own ninety percent of you know XYZ company that's trading at ten million dollar valuation. You know, put nine million dollars in the till, and you got a ten million dollar market cap, and you own ninety percent of it, and you can go, oh, look at all this insider ownership. Show me what percentage of the company you own when the company becomes a billion or two billion. I've, I've created multiple billion dollar companies and, um, you know, I, I, my, I'm in the business of bringing the people, bringing the ideas, bringing the capital and working on advancing these projects. And you're not going to find, you know, 50% ownership um, when the companies get to, unless you have a Cinderella fairy tale opportunity where the thing grows very quickly but trying to do that during a bear market is next to impossible. Uh, right. Um, uh, I agree with that. And and eggs in baskets and something, something. But again, if a dollar forty right now an ounce, you think it can go to seven or ten? I mean, that sounds like a, an obvious buying opportunity for, for you as well, then in that case. Yeah. And again, like I've got to balance my investment. I, I don't think telegraphing my moves is number one, the prudent thing to do, the responsible thing to do. And uh, just got to look at, you know, my, my entire portfolio. And again, I've got a lot of exposure to Dolly Varden and, um, and I'm, I'm happy with my exposure. And if I decide to invest or divest in the next 12 or 18 months, you know, I'll, I'll be making those uh, and I'll be filing. Yeah, of course, as it always has to. Good. Well, Sean, there's been a good overview. What else are you investing in in terms of uh, metals? Like what, what else besides silver? You don't have to give me any specific names if you don't want to, but what else besides silver? 
Listen, I, I'm a gold bug and have been for 20 years. And I almost kind of look at the things I'm doing in silver as just a way to try to get more gold exposure. So I love gold. I love silver. I'm very boring that way. Um, I've spent 20 years focused on gold and I'm going to continue to because now it's relevant and it's trading at all time highs and there's, but I've got my, you know, what the table is made for myself. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if my future, the next 20 years is not so gold focused. And um, I'm, I'm, I have been, and will continue to place a lot of bets in the copper space. Okay. So very, very excited about uh, the prospects of copper, but I think, Now's the time for silver. Now's the time for gold. And I think, uh, but if you were looking at the next couple of decades, I think uh, uh, I'm investing heavily in copper right now. And uh, yeah. All right, moving on, that would be IAD Gold, a gold producing and development company looking to become a mid-tier producer through growing its projects in the U.S., Nevada specifically, where they house nearly 15 million ounces of the yellow pet rock and over 180 million ounces of the silverish pet rock, as well as some zinc and lead, by the way, that's not included in those gold and silver numbers. Companies listed on a TSX main board as well as the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol IAU and IAUX, respectively, with an average of about 600,000 shares trading on the TSX daily and a 52-week high of $3.60 as well as a 52-week low of $1.68. With a market cap of under $615 million and 300 million shares outstanding, today this is a $2 stock. According to the most recent presentation, there are 24 million warrants and 11 million options, resulting in about 335 million fully diluted shares. As of the last interim financial statement, which is uh, dated December 31, the company had almost $40 million in current assets, over 16 million of which in actual cash, 11.4 million in inventories, as well as some account receivables and uh, prepaid expenses. That sat against almost $61 million in current liabilities, mostly made up by a $32 million current portion of the long-term debt with account payables and um, accrued liabilities being the other two large parts of the of the short-term liabilities. In terms of long-term debt, there is a $148 million portion still open, or was at least at the end of December uh, last year, and $17 million in other liabilities, as well as a $71 million provision for environmental rehabilitation. That's something we don't typically see because I don't speak to producers all that often, but maybe Ewan can tell me more about it later on. According to the same financial statement, I-80 spent on average about a million and a half dollars per month on general and administrative expenses, whereas exploration, uh, evaluation, and pre-development shows up as a $3.2 million expense on a P&L on a monthly basis. That is, with the vast majority, so about $2 million per month on average uh, and over 2023, going into drilling, leaving the GNA to drilling ratio at around one to 1.4, meaning GNA was about 75% the size of the drilling expenditures. This is a producing company, though, so there is revenue, specifically almost $55 million of it in 2023. Uh, quite the jump, about a 50% jump over 2022. But unfortunately, the cost of production has also jumped, as it has for many of the producers out there. With I-80, specifically, it's jumped by 85%, resulting in an operating loss as well as a net loss for the year, which means they still rely on capital markets for financing, uh, and they raised a total of $27.7 million in 2023, with all of these numbers being in U.S. dollars, by the way. Please do head over to the company's website as well as setterplus.ca to review the most up-to-date numbers by the time you're watching this, because, again, this is an active company. Uh, they've been drilling a lot. I'll tell you more about that here in a second, but they also raise money, so the situation will have changed. Boring stuff aside, though, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is an aspiring mid-tier gold producer. They're hoping to get there within five years. But as it, as it turns out, gold doesn't like being bored in Nevada. So at one of the company's assets, Ruby Hill, it hangs with other metals like uh, zinc, copper, and lead. And um, Ruby Hill is still on the Battle Mountain slash Eureka trend in Nevada. So it's typically a gold trend. Uh, and this is also where the Archimedes open pit mine is. This is a Carlin-style mineralization open pit mine. 
There's also a, a crushing plant, a grinding mill, and a leach pad, um, as well as a carbon circuit, by the way, all of which was used to produce gold last year, specifically 6,643 ounces of it, which then sold for an average price of $1,910 per ounce, driving over $12.5 million of revenue in 2023. Ruby Hill is also where a large portion, so $17 million of the in total $39 million exploration spent went in during the fiscal 2023, which was also used to... Uh, grow and develop the, the multiple CRD discoveries. That's where the um, um, the, the uh, polymetallic mineralization comes from, as I told you about. So sort of zoning in and better understanding that. Uh, this is a very interesting situation here because you only typically get one type of mineralization. But again, Ruby Hill has a few. So there's oxide gold, sulfide gold, and, and, and again, that polymetallic CRD and SCAR and base metal mineralization is there as well. Uh, Granite Creek, I'm kind of running through these, otherwise this is going to be 25 minutes and people are, are going to die of boredom listening to my voice. But Granite Creek is another significant mine in I-80's portfolio. It's a Carlin-style deposit that is currently operating only as an open pit, but that's not it. It does apparently have an underground mineable mineralization that is permitted and currently under construction. Uh, this one is in the Potosi Mining District, so relatively close to Ruby Hill, in Nevada terms at least. Um, 1,745 ounces of gold were produced here last year, and they were sold for $1,940 each, uh, resulting in a little over uh, under, a little under $3.5 million of revenue, I believe. Yeah, uh, but there's also an additional 7.7 thousand ounces of gold that was sold during 2023 in, in, in the form of um, sulfite material, which resulted in $26.3 million of revenue for the year. While not a lot of drilling happened here, um, well, for the size of the company at least, but $3.7 million was spent on exploration at Granite Creek last year. Loan 3 is the other large part of the production profile here, both an underground and open pit operation and holding over um, 2.7 million ounces of gold itself. It's located between Granite Creek and the other project that I'll tell you about here in a minute. Uh, almost as much gold was produced here as it was at Ruby Hill, so 6,225 um, ounces being sold on an average annual price of $1,972, bringing in a total of $12.3 million for the company, whereas no money was spent on exploration here in 2023, but despite known mineralization remaining uh, open in all directions, which is also why I-80 thinks that this will become the hub of their operations over the long run. This is also where, if and when permitted and built, um, the uh, Granite Creek underground portion is going to be trucked to and uh, processed at. What did see a big exploration spend last year, though, was McCoy Cove, that's uh, an, an exploration development project that's within the McCoy Mining District, and um, a total of $14 million was spent on this project in 2023, which, together with Ruby Hill, as you can see, accounts for about 80% of that exploration spent for the entire year, while the vast majority of the revenue came from Ruby Hill and Granite Creek, again, as I pointed out. A relatively new project for the company since last summer is the FAD project, which hosts the FAD deposit, which is Ruby Hill's basic, you can call it sister or next door neighbor, whatever you want. Um, I-80's got 100% interest in this property uh, in a share for shares type of deal, which um, ended costing something like shy of 90, 90 million dollars, uh, if I read that correctly. The FAD deposit is that CRD, right? Something we talked about last week. And I-80 believes it's essentially an extension of the first Ruby Hill mine to a depth of um, about 700 meters. So essentially, with this acquisition, um, I-80 is expanding Ruby Hill's uh, footprint. So in a few words, there's a lot going on with I-80, and that's exactly where I want to kick it off, Ewan, because you have been very active in this district, uh, but you're definitely not alone. You have some big boy neighbors, basically, um, and you state that your long-term goal is to become a mid-tier producer. So between half and, and 1 million ounces of gold each year uh, within five years. But that probably mean more consolidation of the district, um, or it's going to mean more, a whole lot more exploration, uh, but not before you've grown and built what you already have right now. So it's a little bit of, it looks to me a little bit like it might be sort of a, a bottleneck or more of a strategy decision. So what what is the way forward, basically? Let's take it up from there. More production, more m and more exploration. What's the focus? Yeah, M&A isn't something we're currently pursuing at this time. Um, if you look at the, the details on what we're doing, we are currently planning to build three underground mines basically simultaneously. And when you when you look at our gold production at Ruby Hill and from Lone Tree, 
that gold production is solely from residual leaching. So the previous open pit mining operation, the heap leach pads are still being, uh, we're still putting cyanide on those and we are still recovering gold um, at, in a profitable basis. But in terms of our longer term plan to grow our production, that production will come from the construction of three underground mines. Uh, Granite Creek is the most advanced. So we are underground on that project. We have completed in 23 um, test mining is what we call it. We haven't declared commercial production. And we uh, continue to delineate what we expect to be the main deposit through drilling called the South, the South Pacific Zone that we intend to develop this year to become really the cornerstone deposit for the Granite Creek mine. And we would expect that really in the second half of this year and into next year is when we will start to see um, increase per really increased production and lowering of costs as we bring on what is really our first main deposit. The Cove project where you mentioned we spent a fair amount of money last year, we have put in the phase one of the underground project. So we put in a decline, um, a portal and a decline to provide a platform to drill off the main high grade deposit that occurs immediately below that platform in order to advance the Cove project to full feasibility. We are looking to do the same thing at Ruby Hill once we get the permits starting uh, mid this year. And Ruby Hill will be the third project that we start driving underground infrastructure. So um, our achievement of our, our longer term aspiration to become a mid-tier producer is really through developing the existing three deposits. Uh, Ruby Hill has the uh, is is blessed with mineralization. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, in addition to the gold that we intend to develop there, what we call the Ruby Deeps deposit, uh, it's not that deep, but it is underneath the Archimedes pit, immediately to the uh, southwest east and to the east of that deposit are the Skarn and high-grade Skarn and CRD deposits that we call Blackjack and Hilltop that will be developed simultaneously with the gold. So when we say our, our plan is to be a four to 500,000 ounce a year producer in the next several years, that is on a gold equivalent basis because there's obviously a, a very high tenor of lead and zinc that occurs with the precious metals in the Ruby Hill polymetallic deposits. That's right. Uh, and and that is that first thing that you mentioned there, building them simultaneously is basically where I want to pick it up from because it's, it's rather aggressive, right? So basically I'm thinking about why not wait? And I mean, I suppose this is the oldest strategy question in here, but why go for venture capital instead of grow it sort of organically, figure out profitability first and then grow slowly over say 20 years instead of growing over five years? What's that strategy decision there? We have two processing plans. So that that the strategy could change as we go forward. Obviously, it has been a difficult year in 23, uh, in particular, in the first half of or first quarter of 24 this year for the mining stocks. Mining hasn't been, uh, I think the narrative hasn't been truly in our favor. And there's not a capital, not a lot of capital flowing into the business. So it it, it is a challenging endeavor to build three mines at once. Uh, we did announce early, uh, late in 2023, that we have signed a term sheet with a third party to help develop Ruby Hill. So because it is such an aggressive plan in a challenging market, we felt it would be prudent to consider bringing in a partner to help build at least one of our projects and use somebody else's capital instead of ours. So that that um, the agreements that go towards that being finalized are currently going back and forth and being negotiate negotiated and finalized. Uh, but once that's done, it will be an assistance in capital. And and Ruby Hill with the polymetallics will become a major um, focus for us, uh, so to speak, because the polymetallics are quite high grade. The mill is already there, the processing plant that we're looking to convert for convert to flotation. So the capital costs, when you look at other mining projects is quite minimal. And we are looking to potentially, or we are currently focusing on that asset because it is the least capital intensive and likely the first one to be turned on 
that will produce, we expect to be quite significantly cash flow positive. And potentially we could slow down the gold development to allow for cash flow to help build out those operations if we wanted to slow down our target, so to speak. But currently we are continuing to advance all the projects. It's really critical in our industry to get sufficient drilling done in these deposits in order to complete what we call feasibility studies. And on the back of feasibility studies, then you could look to access equipment, lease finance or debt, and use other instruments to help buy, uh, build your business. So those are there's many things going on in the background in our company, and it's really critical for us to continue to advance the projects so that we can get to that ultimate position of being a cash flowing company. When you look at our the goal of who we want to be, companies like Alamos Gold or Gold are of similar size as what we expect to be in several years. And our market cap in terms of US dollars is currently sitting somewhere around 450, whereas their market cap is, I believe it's somewhere around 6 million, 6 billion today. So while we're, you know, a relatively large explorer developer company in terms of market capitalization, we are just a fraction of the market capitalization of what you see on producers of this scale. So getting to that scale is pretty important to us. It's just how quickly can we do it? it well, it's exactly that part, that market cap difference with, between you. Cause you run it on, on every type of metric, basically, that you want. And we now have explorers that have a higher market cap than you than you do right now. And, and that begs the question, like, is is what you're doing what the market wants because again 39 million bucks went into the ground over over the fiscal 2023 and the stock fell 50 percent. so instead of that 39 million bucks adding shareholder value it, it almost seems like it's taking it away so what do you think the market wants i think i think we've just been um caught up in that lack of capital portion of the market it's kind of where uranium was a few years ago when there was no real narrative towards that sector and the stocks had depreciated and a lot of the gold stocks especially explorers and developers were hit quite hard in 2023 and we were one of those companies and while we can continue to maintain a pretty aggressive pace of development um, it we weren't rewarded by the market and we like you <laughs> kind of scratch our head and say we had a lot of success if you look at the results we put out from all three projects that we're drilling these results are amongst the highest grade and most significant results you'll see globally and yet our market cap uh, did go down significantly during the year so we we also try to listen to what our shareholders are we do listen to what our shareholders say and they want to see us become a cash flow positive company ultimately and you only do that by continuing to spend money in this business mining is a quite a capital intensive business and it often takes many years just to get a permit and then it takes even longer to build and then become a cash flowing company hmm. we have all brownfield sites that are permitted so it gives us an advantage it allows us to fast track our development and operations comparatively but like you mentioned there are some explorer calls that are trading at market caps higher than us and they're just drilling holes and they haven't even started the permitting process to allow for uh to allow for development and production or put out any numbers around what the capital is ultimately going to be mm. um so it's just been i think it's the narrative hasn't been in in the favor of of mining companies in general of late and particularly the development companies like ours who are spending capital to meet their long-term goals. Mm. We have Pierre Lassonde and his curve to blame for that. I should make a new curve and just make it go from upper left to lower right. That's maybe more fitting for this time of the market. But how um, do you think you're going to be bringing in any more partners, though, uh, for, for all three of those? Or is it just sort of on a see-as-you-go basis type of thing? Uh, I, I would say never say never uh, to help develop these projects. You know, we 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 do realize that the need for capital is is quite significant over the next several years. So, you know, we I think we'd prefer 
a partner who is a financial partner rather than a direct partner in the project. Uh, but it is is possible if we saw the right transactional terms that we could consider a partner to build all of the business. It is a we do have one of the largest uh, bases of re resource gold and silver in all of the United States. And, you know, in some ways, you know, there's a, enough to share, so to speak. Mm. Right. Yeah. Okay. Fair. Um, that's, yeah, well, not something you can tell me more about right now, but it'd be, that's something I will be paying attention to. What do you, um, how many years do you think it's going to take before you become profitable? Again, another sort of a wild guess here, of course, but you say five years before you become a mid-tier producer, you're targeting, I believe, 400,000 ounces within that five year. Um, are you going to be profitable by then, or is it going to take another five after that to get profitable? I, I would think that over the three to five year term, we should start to see profits more individually by project. As we ramp up Granite Creek to full development, uh, currently we have a processing agreement with our next door neighbor, Nevada Gold Mines, at the Turquoise Ridge operation. And when we build out the South Pacific zone and it becomes part of our daily production profile, we actually expect within the next 12 months that that asset on a standalone basis will be generating positive revenue versus the mining. So it'll be the first profitable on a buy project uh, basis, but we, we are still developing Cove. We are still developing Ruby Hill. And ultimately we have to convert those plants. So uh, it's really, I believe that when we bring on the Ruby Hill polymetallic deposit, that we we expect to become more cash flow positive and that will be when we get to the point where we can start looking at using that cash flow to build our business and that is expected to be in about 26 or 27. You, you uh, just said that yeah you, you just said that you pay attention to sort of a, what, what shareholders are saying and what they want that's sort of what I was trying to do right before this interview kind of bring myself up to date with the online chatter if you will around i80 and the audience seems to be split between the long-term strategy, like what is a long-term strategy? And they're split between, do you sell in the meantime as all of this is happening that you told me, or do you become one of the very few mine builders left in the market? Because, because again, and that's something we can talk about. There's not that many mine builders. There's a couple of mine buyers who buy ready mines, but not many people are actually out there building mines. So what do you think is the long-term strategy? Sell in the meantime or just build this into a mid-tier and then a large producer? If you look at where I80 came from, it came from a spin-out of a takeover. So my previous company, Premier Gold Mines, uh, with the large Greenstone project in northwestern Ontario, we were acquired uh, just, just about three years ago now. And as part of the acquisition, we spun out the Nevada portfolio and are now advancing just Nevada. We've made several acquisitions. We've assembled a team um, led by Matt Gilly, who's our president in Reno, uh, who have tremendous experience, not only building uh, mines in Nevada, but operating those mines. So we've, we've assembled a team who has built and run operations in the state. So our goal is to build that mid-tier mining company However, as in the past, if we got the right proposal come, come our way or the right circumstances were there, uh, M&A is always a possibility when you have large scale resources and safe jurisdictions. Do you think royalty is going to be part of that mix too? And at what stage would you typically get most of the attention from royalties? Um, royalties and streams, we, we, we do have royalties. So these, some of these assets are, have been previously mined, um, Barrick or N Newmont was mining Lone Tree mm -hmm. and there are royalties associated with the various projects. So tacking on additional royalties is not something that's part of our <clears throat> near-term or long-term strategy. Um, we do have a gold prepay, so we sold gold forward, um, that's a strategy we we have employed because while you might take a discount on the metal in se in two or three years, that royalty, so to speak, goes away. Whereas mm -hmm. when you put a royalty or a stream on your asset, that goes forever. Uh, mm -hmm. Typically, those agreements are a forever um, hindrance on your future cash flow. 
And uh, so we try to avoid those as much as possible, but we have used those in the past to continue to build out our business. So um, it is a, a sector of our industry where there has been access to capital, maybe a bit more uh, than the equity markets over the past several years. So it's something that we have employed and other companies employ, and we will continue to consider that as part of our growth plan, but not a cornerstone part of our growth plan. Hmm. Fair point. I like that last sentence. It, it made it more clear for me. Do you personally or anyone else within your team own any of the royalties on any of the projects that you're involved in right now? No. Okay. Um, talking about royalties and royalty companies, maybe this is a good segue to talking about some of your existing partners like Equinox Gold, for example. They've um, also been sort of feeling the pain in the market, if you will, that we talked about. They've uh, also had to sell some stock of IE80 in the meantime. Are you talking to them? What are they telling you about the, the rest of the position? Uh, what are the other large shareholders telling you about their stock, given, I mean, given, again, the, the difficult markets here? Um, I think there's there's always buyers and sellers in our market. You can't stop people from from doing what they want with uh, with their capital. Equinox Gold, like ourselves, are in a position where they are building out operations as well. So it's a time when they, like us, need capital. And they did sell some of their block, and it's possible going forward that they would uh, they would sell more. Um, other large shareholders, um, um, I think our second largest shareholder is the Sprott uh, Funds out of uh, out of the U.S. And they participated in, and I believe all of the financings we've completed to date. And I'm listed as one of the top shareholders. And and similarly, I've participated in every financing we've done to date. What maybe you can talk to me about how that I, I know how that happens with juniors when there's like a big shareholder. He wants to sell. He goes up the CEO. The CEO then looks for a, a new home for the shares so that it doesn't create too much of a market reaction. How does that work on? your guys' level where it's like two large companies interacting with each other. If Equinox were to sell, are they going to call you up and say, Ewan, can you find someone for these shares so that we don't crash the price? Like, how does that work? Typically, that's what uh, what companies do when they, when they move shares. Hmm. Um, I would say the last time that uh, the, their shares were moved, they used a bank to do it. Um, so they uh, went through your typical kind of private placement style arrangement to to move our block of stock. Um, but I would I would hope that the, we'd at least or or I'd expect that we'd at least uh, going forward get a heads up that you know, do you know a, a place where these could go if and when they were decided to to move the rest of that block? And I'd hope that all of our our big shareholders would do the same. So any fund would say, you know, we're we're moving our, our shares around. A lot of funds over the last year have had redemptions. So um, if we know where there is a, a potential buyer, we'd, we'd always like to marry a buyer with a seller where possible. Yeah. Well, I hope Greg's listening to you here right now, although I doubt it, but it'd be nice. If he is, he should hit me up. I do an interview with him too. Uh, and good for the bankers who are placing these shares too, right? Um, and um, yeah, I think that about covers sort of the um, the strategy portion, if you will, looking sort of at the notes that I've taken. Um, maybe you can talk about the well, talk about it on an asset per asset basis of what you have going on right now. Ruby Hill, a lot of money is going into it. Um, I, I sometimes listening to, I feel like you're in in love with this asset. Is this your favorite asset? I would say it's our flagship asset, and it's our flagship asset because of the discoveries we've made. These polymetallic zones that we are delineating um, are, are, I would say, amongst the most significant discoveries I've been involved in in my mining career. So they, these are extremely high grade, uh, very completely open for expansion, and these type of uh, opportunities don't come across in this industry very often. More often than not, you have a project, you have a good uh, prospect, and when you start drilling it out, it disappears faster than it expands. And at Ruby Hill, we've been very fortunate to have discovered multiple deposits. And as we drill them, they are getting bigger and bigger. The last step out hole in the East Hilltop discovery 
I, it was our biggest intercept so far. It was a 114 meter intercept of high grade uh, zinc with some gold and silver mineralization, actually increase in copper, which was really interesting about that deposit is there is some uh, significant copper mineralization coming in as we've been drilling out that deposit. And like I said, I, I come from an exploration background I've uh, been doing this for 26 years, I think, and and I'd say this is one of my most significant discoveries that I've been involved in, in that 26-year career. So it, it's hard not to fall in love with it when you're, when you're having this kind of success as an ex explorationist. We also discovered or delineated the South Pacific zone over the last three years at Granite Creek. So we're, we're, I'm, I'm quite in love with that because that's another prospect that adjacent to the existing mine workings that we looked at and said, you know, there's, there looks like there could be a much bigger deposit here to the north. And we've so far been successful in delineating that. And these are these results that we published, if you look at our last couple of results from Granite Creek, are consistently sort of 10 to 30 gram material over over appreciable widths. And, and you just don't find that every day. Um, but Cove, I think amongst our projects, if you said, which one uh, is your favorite, in a lot of ways, Cove would be because we acquired Granite Creek and Ruby Hill after we formed I-80, whereas Cove was part of Premier. And we started working that project more than a decade ago. And like we're doing at Granite Creek and Ruby Hill, we had tremendous success finding and delineating a very significant high-grade deposit. In fact, we refer to the Cove deposit as one of, probably in the top three in terms of grade, one of the highest grade development states. So effectively, nearly fully permitted gold projects in all of North America. And we took that project from an exploration concept to a deposit, then permitted it. And subsequent to that, we formed I-80. We have now put in the first phase of underground. So in, in an explorationist career, not a lot of people in our industry actually find a deposit that becomes a, a mining operation. So having started that one a decade ago and getting it to where it is today, and ultimately we expect it's going to be the cornerstone gold asset in our portfolio, in some ways it, it's, it you know tugs at my heartstrings in terms of our, our portfolio. But when, when, when you make a discovery like we did just over a year and a half ago at Ruby Hill, it's hard not to be really enamored with that project, um, at least as early on as you continue to step out and every day you're like, when did we hit today? Did we hit again? Mm -hmm. And that kind of excitement is pretty, um, pretty inspiring in our industry. And last year you spent, as I said, 17 from the 39 million bucks in total on, of, of exploration on that one project right so that's 40 something percent is that sort of the plan this year as well uh, maybe you can talk to me about the total budget for exploration this year and what percentage goes into each one of those assets yeah this year the exploration budget really is dependent on the capital markets the the ability for us to i guess keep the foot on the gas so to speak and ruby hill is again expected to be our biggest spend this year in terms of uh, exploration dollars but once we uh, formally form the, the partnership, we are expecting that that, uh, that drilling will be funded by the partner, not by ourselves. Mm. All and of it? Yes, all of that exploration spend. And that's why we released the final results of the 24 drilling. We drilled a few holes uh, just a few weeks back. And as part of that press release, we put the final holes of the, fir the first phase of drilling because we are right now not doing any drilling on that property so that we don't spend our own dollars uh, with the anticipation of having a partner who will be funding the project for what we expect will be the next couple of years. At Cove, um, we are looking to continue that program and that program is expected to go into 2025 and is another big pro part of our project as we move co from being a a deposit to something that we can actually deliver a feasibility study on and and get to the point where we actually do make a full construction decision uh, so those two have a lot of uh drilling planned uh, for the next 
I'd say 12, 18 months. And then Granite Creek is more development of underground. But as we're doing that, we plan to do a similar or larger drill program than we did last year. So I'd like to think that ultimately we'll be in a position to do about another 10 or 15 million there this year. But that will obviously be um, uh, uh, budget dependent. Right. Capital markets dependent too. What are you doing any more metallurgical work at Ruby Hill? I think you did some last year. Um, but we have, it, it, well, eventually we have to know how these things are going to work and the type of circuits that you're going to have to install for the, but other concentrates and stuff like that. So are you doing any work on that? Yes, we, we did a, a fair amount of metallurgy on all of the polymetallics deposits last year. So on the hilltop zones, on blackjack, on FAD, which was the acquisition we made to the south in 2023. And we are expecting the final report from our work here in the coming weeks. So the, that part of that project has been advanced significantly over the past 12 months. And, the, and there's additional work that'll continue to be done on that until we ultimately start up the, the plant. But um, other than where we get oxidation of the sulfides, which is only in the upper parts of the mineralization, we are expecting this to be, uh, especially the SCARN and the bigger FAD deposit, what we see in terms of mineralogy, we're expecting these to be comparatively very, very good metallurgical properties when you look at similar type deposits across the globe. Mm. Okay. Fair, fair point. That's uh, exactly where I was going with this, trying to figure out how it's going to be. But then eventually you're going to be selling, um, what, a zinc concentrate? Is that what you're hoping to be selling or a copper concentrate? Uh, zinc and a lead is what we, there's mineralization that we, we're we looking to uh, convert the Ruby Hill plant to a base metal flotation plant with two circuits, a, a zinc and a, and a lead circuit, and sell two separate concentrates. Our expectation, and I guess our hope, because we haven't released it yet, when you're drilling these type of deposits and they have a, a large amount of precious metals like the hilltop zones do, you or and and fad, which is extremely high grade in gold and 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 silver, is you hope that the silver mineralization reports to lead, because in lead concentrates you get much better payability out of smelters than you do if you have silver and zinc. Uh, zinc smelters don't recover silver as well. So you're always looking for uh, metallurgical qual quality whereby the silver reports to the um, to the lead concentrate. And same with gold, you, you'd, you'd prefer for the gold to report to lead or be free milling, so to speak. So if you could concentrate that gold on site and process it um, at one of our facilities right there in Nevada would be a much better outcome than it being in a concentrate. So you, you actually hope that uh, if possible, the gold becomes free milling and then you can, you can get it much more quickly. It doesn't have to go on a train and then a boat to a smelter and then you get paid for it. You get your payability much quicker. So um, those are the things I'd say to look out for when any company releases metallurgy, including ourselves. And what we've seen so far looks quite encouraging. So we're, mm. we're, we're really liking what we're seeing in terms of results to date. I'm not hearing much about the copper payability. Um, I, I know some smelters don't pay as much as, as you would technically get paid for on a spreadsheet. So maybe you can talk to me about that as well. The copper mineralization is just starting to come into the equation at Ruby Hill. So most of the the blackjack deposit is is effectively very low in copper. It doesn't have a, a enough copper that we would look at putting in a copper circuit. Similarly, FAD has very little uh, copper mineralization. And the upper uh, and lower hilltop zones that we first discovered in in uh, on the south side of the Archimedes pit are also fairly low in copper. So it, it isn't until recently when we discovered the East Hilltop zones and have been drilling that out and especially stepping out to the south and at depth that we've started to see elevated copper. In fact, over smaller intervals, we've seen, seen over a percent lately. Mm -hmm. And there's copper mines that produce at less than a percent. And that 1% copper is coming in with 
say 20% zinc. So we're not jumping up and down about the copper yet because it's early days in terms of developing that. So in our current vision of concentrates, right now copper is not part of that equation. But as we continue to, to hopefully grow this East Hilltop discovery, we're definitely hoping that that transitions to a copper deposit. And that would really be a game changer for us as a company as well, I think. I think Mark Bristow is also hoping that it transitions into a copper discovery too, given his recent media appearances. What uh, yeah. Are you still targeting a Q2 for an updated resource here, or do you think it's going to take longer now? Um, the resource for the polymetallic zones, we're still targeting a Q2 release, probably late Q2. Uh, we have now, since we finished the last drilling, we, um, of the the drilling we were doing. So it's been about an 18 month drill program. We, we performed on those polymetallic deposits and we are now at a position where we've got all of the assays in. So we're modeling those deposits. We do a lot of that modeling internally first, and we're talking with two or three different um, independent engineering firms in order for them to come in, do whatever they need to do take our data, build a resource and and publish that resource. So we we have a in the next month we'll have a good idea internally what what those look like, but it's getting the them to a point where we meet the 43101 requirements to release a resource that is mm -hmm. going to take some additional time. So we're still planning mid-year is uh targeting that as being our our release date for the polymetallic resources. And on a gold equivalent basis, we expect that's going to add a significant amount of gold gold equivalent to our uh, our resource ba base, which is already one of the the most significant in the U.S., particularly in Nevada. And mm -hmm. um, none of the polymetallic deposits are currently part of our um, quoted resource that you'll find uh, as a company. Mm. So we, we've talked about exploration spend updated resource here in Ruby Hill. Are you guiding any production? Is that some, I know that's something you don't typically do, but how much do you want to produce this year? This year, assuming we get in, develop the South Pacific zone, our target would be to do more than we did in 2023. 2023 was a pretty good year in terms of our production because of, as you mentioned, six, 7,000 ounces coming out of Ruby Hill and Lone Tree. But those, as I mentioned, are residual leach programs that are winding down. So we'll actually be not um, not producing that gold here, probably shortly at at least one of the sites as it moves to the point where it's not actually profitable to do so. But they are so, it's, it's marginal profitability on those residual leach programs. It's just at the tail end of the uh, curve that comes off of leach pad that we're getting gold. And it's just been almost a bonus for us over the past couple of years, but it's not part of what we expect to be our long-term um, growth profile. Hmm. Do you, um, a lot of the cost increase, if I recall correctly from your financial statements came from Ruby Hill last year. Is that related to what you were just telling me? Yes. Yes, it okay. is. Uh, it is residual leaching and and residual leaching of 6,000 ounces isn't a company maker. So it's it's something we do because we have the ability to do it. It does pay for a lot of the site costs and, th and the people being there, but it's not something we plan on being a cornerstone for our company. Uh, it's it, it allows us to permit, uh, I'd say more quickly or assist with permitting because these are fully permitted mine sites. Um, the residual leach is coming from the open pit and we're putting the infrastructure at Ruby Hill to access the high grade deposits around the pit from within that pit. So it actually reduces our long-term costs for uh, the capital required to build out that mine because instead of building a, a, a decline from surface and going down 700 meters, say we're going down 200 meters and we only have to go down 500 meters. So it's actually a capital saving event and we're, we're planning to do exactly what we have at Granite Creek and at Ruby Hill. So okay. two declines out of the existing pit to access the higher grade mineralization uh, peripheral to that open pit. Hmm. 
So essentially this year, you're expecting better margins than, than last year. More in the second half of the year. The first half of this year, we're still seeing no real production, so to speak. We're still in the development stage at, at Granite Creek. And it's really our expectation in the second half of this year is when we'll have multiple levels built into the South Pacific zone that'll allow for full-time mining. We want to test mine that zone and ensure that the ground conditions are sufficient to support long-term mining before we call a construction decision. Uh, but on demonstrating that it is a mineable deposit, we can demonstrate that with the costs expected for that mining, that it is going to be a profitable operation. That's when you'd expect us to announce a, a feasible or a construction or a production decision and start to provide guidance. At this time, we want to make sure that each zone that will be part of our long-term mine plan is actually mineable. Uh, in Nevada, a lot of the deposits are associated with uh, major fault structures. And at times you can have bad ground conditions. It's known uh, to have, you know, ground condition condition issues at some mines, not all mines. But that's across the globe, you see that, because uh, fault structures are very important for the mineral mineralizing fluids. And so you're dealing often with different rock types and, and sometimes ground condition issues. And those ground condition issues can be insurmountable in operations. And we want to make sure that's not the case at our project before we um, put in the last big part of capital, say building out our mills. We don't want to do that until we've demonstrated that each deposit is mineable first. And then you put up the big capital, which is, is starting up your mills. So we're trying to do things on a much more regimented basis, more like more like how a major mining company would develop an operation. The newest gold mine coming into production in Nevada is Gold Rush. That's a very large operation being uh, constructed by Nevada Gold Mines at Cortez. And Gold Rush, I believe Nevada Gold Mines went underground four years ago on that project. They did all of the underground drilling. Uh, they did all the final permitting for long-term development. They've, I'm sure they've now demonstrated to themselves that this deposit is mineable in a profitable basis. And it was only a month or two ago that they officially announced that that is becoming a mine. So um, it, it took them many years to get there. We're hoping to do it much more quickly than that um, because we're not trying to build a mine that's going to produce four to 500,000 ounces on its own a year. So they had to put in a lot of development to get to the point where they can turn it on at that type of uh, scale. Whereas we're looking at going in and doing sort of 50 to 150,000 ounce a year operations with less uh, capital put in and hopefully as good or higher grades than what you're going to see coming out of Gold Rush. So hmm. the grade will hopefully make up a bit for the lesser amount of ounces produced. And, and essentially to translate this to my five-year-old brain, you're looking for rocks that are hard enough to sustain production, but not too hard so they break your mills basically. Um, exactly. Okay. Actually, in mining, you want as soft as a rock as you want because they're the easiest to crush, the easiest to liberate. And long term, it it it, it actually makes your long term cost or can assist in making you a much lower cost per ounce or per pound company compared to your peers if you have soft rock. So Nevada has, for the most part, soft rock, but it's the wall rocks so the foot wall and hang wall rocks you hope are much more competent so that they withstand the mining scenario um mm. but yeah good good point i wouldn't have pointed that out about hard and soft rock unless you unless you brought it up <laughs> that's pretty much the only thing i know about geology here so it's helpful what do you um do you have the ability well, as far as i understand it right now based on what you're telling me you don't necessarily have the ability to um, move around with the gold price, as in like if gold shoots to finally the $10,000 that everyone is always promising me here over the next couple of years, do you have the ability to do everything that you're doing much quicker or is it really um, gold equities price dependent more than it is gold price dependent? I think those two go hand in hand. Um, when, when gold price typically, except for what we've seen in the last year, typically when 
the gold price moves, the equities move much higher. Um, there's much more access to capital for, for companies who are looking to develop. And, um, and I would think that if we do go to 22, 23, 24, 25, and even 10, as you mentioned, that there will be very significant interest in the sector. And that will translate into uh, additional access to capital, which could allow us to fast track projects. Um, but in terms of the deposits we want to build, it won't make much change. You might mine a bit lower grade than you're thinking about now with higher gold prices because you can take out more, you can sort of lower your cutoff grade, so to speak. So instead of everything that's three grams or less, you say, I don't want that. I just want everything that's three grams or more. Maybe that goes to two grams and and if the gold price goes up. So it, it just allows a bit of flexibility in your operation. But uh, I wouldn't say it would make a huge difference in in how much we would be mining. Right. Okay. Fair point. We haven't really. Oh, I know you don't have too much time left anymore here, but we haven't really talked about GNA too much. I typically like asking about it when I'm looking at explorers, but when I see like two hundred grand ish, I start frowning. And then with you, I see a million and a half. Obviously, a much larger company. It's almost multiple companies together, right? You're doing exploration, you're doing development, and you're doing production. So it obviously makes sense to have a higher GNA. But so I don't necessarily know how to look at it. But yeah, I I came out at a bit about a million and a half G and E a month. Is that what you're targeting for 2024 as well? Yeah, we have um we we have people uh, and um, a production facility at Lone Tree. We also have an operating assay lab there that we we operate. So that G and A includes running that site, having those employees there. Same with that Ruby Hill. We have where we're running that heat leach pad, we are advancing uh, the permitting to go underground and build the Ruby Hill mine, uh, polymetallics and gold. So we have a staff there and we have a, an active heat leach pad, which we have to take care of. And then at Granite Creek, we're underground on that project and we have uh, mine site people, we have power, everything that's associated with that. Every site has grid power. And then a cove we put in the underground, we have grid power, we have people on site. So we do have a fairly, uh, on, having four active sites, we have a, a, a large number of employees. And when the more employees you have, the more GNA you have. And then there's the cost of running a company going to GNA, the legal, the accounting, et cetera. So I would say comparatively, of companies who are doing what we're doing with four sites, we'd be on the low end, not on the high end. Yeah. But essentially that's what you're targeting for 2024 as well, about a million and a half a month. Yep. But similar to what we had in 2023. Yep. So not, yeah. Okay. Not necessarily expecting anything to change largely. Well, that makes sense too with, with your, um with your partner, who's going to be financing it. You're going to stay up. You're going to stay the operator. They're going to finance it. Right. Cause you, you know, the geology there, I assume. Yeah, the what we did put out is that the, the term sheet that we signed provides for the partner to acquire a minority interest, mm -hmm. not a majority, and we will remain operator. A lot of joint venture part, partners, when they come in, are um, will only be a partner if they get to, uh, a, a majority interest. Typically, in joint venture scenarios, when smaller companies bring in a partner to develop, it's a larger company. And the larger company often wants control. Uh, we were able to secure a partner who did not want to operate the site. They wanted us to continue operating. And that's why we chose this partner is because we get to maintain the majority interest in the project. We get to maintain control through operatorship. And it was just a much better scenario for us. Yeah. Good. Well, this has been a, a, a very good overview, you, and I know you have to go now. Uh, I really do appreciate you investing so much time in me, and hopefully I can get an update anytime soon when you have some of those results or potentially that um, uh, 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 official structure of the partnership going forward. But uh, it's been nice. What did you? Uh, what am I? What am I forgetting to ask you? What did you come here hoping to talk about, but I'm failing to bring up? Uh, I, I just say that we are a company that trades on the New York and Toronto Stock Exchange. In total gold resources, that's measured, indicated, plus inferred. We have uh, over 14 and a half million ounces, which makes us one of the largest holders of gold resources in the United States. 
And with that gold endowment, we are expecting to transition to a mining company that will be amongst the highest or amongst the largest gold producing companies in the uh, in this in the country.